Are you all there? Okay. So I'm starting. Good morning. Uh, my name is Felipe uh, Marelli. Welcome to the second day of our seminar of uh, Pan European Digital Asset Supporting Research Communities. What are the benefits and what are the opportunities? So, as you know, I think that all of you were also here yesterday. But just in case, what we have been uh, uh, doing yesterday, we have been going through uh, how digital assets are supporting, in particular, uh, SDG 13, climate action, SDG 3, good health and well being, and also a service for open science. Uh, this, uh, this seminar is organized by Els Future and the project that you see there from the Infra Elsk uh, 7 uh, program, which are C-Scale, DICE, AGIAs, Open Air, Nexus, and Reliance. Uh, so what we, we are going to do today, let me go to the next slide. So this is me, I'm Fulvio Marelli, I'm the responsible of uh, uh, the outreach and communication work package for the Reliance project. There are going to be some presentations from the Reliance project. And in particular today, what we're going to do is to see how digital assets are supporting SDG 9. So we are talking about industry, innovation, and infrastructures. So as you maybe have been seeing, we are recording the session. All the session, both yesterday and today, are going to be available on the event website. So as we finish all our uh, you know, the seminar, the two uh, registration from yesterday and today are going to be uploaded over there, okay? Uh, of course, I'm asking you kindly to mute your microphone so that there are no uh, background noise, but uh, let's say, let's go for, uh, through the agenda of the day. So we are in this first session about SDG, Industry Innovation Infrastructure, and we are going to have three interesting, super interesting use cases uh, by Elisa Trasatti, by Timothy Schimwell, and Federica Fondini. Then we are going to have a break. Uh, so for, uh, for my panelists, let's say, uh, you are going to have like 10 minutes, uh, around 10 minutes presentation, but we will also have time for question and answer. So in case we can, we can, we can adapt, I mean, uh, to, to, to the program. Then we are going to have a break. We are going to have a second session that are, is going to be chaired by Davide Poletto, uh, describing the experience from early adopter approaching EOSC. Uh, we have been doing in Reliance an open challenge and uh, Davide and his guest are going to provide some information about, you know, this experience. There is going to be a second break and then uh, I think it is very important that uh, you, you participate and you provide all your inputs to what is going to be the final session from 11 to 12. We are going to talk about the lesson learned from all the use cases that we have been looking at yesterday and today. And this is fundamental to understand how to move forward, how these services that you've been looking at yesterday and you will see today can be evolved into, you know, in, into the next phase. Now, just a little bit of housekeeping uh, as for yesterday, uh, to tell you that this event is recording and uh, do not activate your microphone, I already said this, but the most important part is that you can join the discussion on Slido. So this is the event code, you can, you can both uh, use the QR code or the event code, you will be redirected to this page, okay? And welcome. And uh, so you will be redirected here. So while people are, uh, I'm, I'm the anonymous guy here. Uh, so while, while people are doing their presentation, I will be checking both the chat of the, of the event and, and the slide. So, okay, so we are here, just, oh, sorry, just a second. Now, when we talk about uh, SDG and we talk about infrastructure, we talk about, what I've been trying to highlight, you know, uh, in black, so this, in the description of the SDG 9, we talk about increasing the scientific research, encourage innovation, uh, uh, and most of all, I think that is 
important to say that all this use case and all these examples that we see have the final goal of increasing the number of people that are actually doing research, both in the private and the public sector. So uh, again, you know how to join the discussion, you know the panelists. I'm going to present Elisa, which is a colleague uh, in, uh, in the Reliance project. Uh, she works at IMG Lee, which is uh, Instituto Nazionale di Geofisica e Volcanologia in Italy. And um, uh, what she does in her research, she is using both satellite data and in situ data uh, to study uh, volcanology and seismology. So uh, I stop sharing my screen, Elisa, and uh, so that you can take it up from here, okay? Okay, good morning, everybody here. Uh, can you see the screen? Yes. So uh, thank you. Uh, good morning. Um, I'm the. Uh, this is the third presentation uh, from Reliance. We are three communities the, um, demonstrating the services that, that has been developed in Reliance. So I represent the geohazard community. Um, so uh, just a brief uh, overview on the Reliance services that were presented also yesterday by uh, Federica and Anne. So Reliance is contributed to the EOS exchange with a set of services for uh, research lifecycle management in support of open science. So first of all, the research object paradigm and the uh, research object management platform, ROHUB. Uh, then the data cube uh, service, so the advanced geospatial data management platform, ADAM, and the tax mining services. So these services in Reliance enhance the uh, discovery and access of uh, large amounts of data, like satellite data, uh, extract knowledge. And as I said, the main uh, most important thing is to manage research life cycle. Uh, let me, um, so uh, the uh, geohazard community. So we deal as geohazard community with deal in reliance in particular with the volcanic risk management cycle. So uh, we are interested on the hazard definition uh, in the mitigation and preparedness phases. So before the eruptions and the emergency phase. So during the eruptions. Let me also introduce briefly this uh, uh, global initiative, the Geohazard Super Sites and National Laboratories. Uh, it's a geo initiative. You see these red places here. They are uh, sites of the world with high volcanic or seismic hazard. So uh, the most important thing of this global initiative is that the space agencies provide commercial data, commercial satellite data for free in these areas, a certain amount per, uh, per year. Um, so uh, this is uh, the, uh, the, the, the main needs of these global communities are also the user requirements for reliance in my case. So we need uh, to access uh, easy access data, time investigations, uh, share results, uh, etc. Um, here are two examples from two super sites. Um, and in the framework of the GOGSNL, so the Super Sites Initiative, I was able to do some pan-European dissemination uh, in Latin America in particular, and um, so showing the uh, reliance services. And, um, in, and we will have later for uh, the early adopters session also talk on uh, this. And so I'm not going to uh, repeat what was shown yesterday by Federica and Anne. Uh, I want just to say with this slide that uh, we uh, collected uh, um, geodetic data of volcanic areas and we uh, been we created several um, we did several scientific investigations mm -hmm. using EGI uh, notebooks. And uh, so uh, they are uh, can be executable because they are uh, uploaded in uh, several uh, research objects. And um, also, um, what I want to say is that uh, we created these research objects using the ROHAB APIs, uh, which I will show uh, later. 
And um, so um, this, uh, uh, the, the APIs, so in particular, the Python library of Roab is very useful when uh, using the, the same software, let's say, to create a, so for with several applications. So it's kind of repetitive uh, kind of uh, uh, resources to be um, uh, aggregating research objects. So it's very useful. And these uh, APIs can be used instead of going to the um, uh, ROHAB uh, site, website, and create it manually. Uh, I want to add in this case here that uh, uh, creating a research object was very useful for, uh, in case of an emergency, this is uh, an eruption from um, the Niragongo volcano of last year in the Democratic Republic of Congo. That time, that moment, I remember it was very confusing because there was not a single entity managing the eruption. So we wanted that, um, so we contributed to produce some operative uh, results, but we wanted it to, to be attributed to us, uh, the intellectual property. So uh, creating a research object and sharing it, so we were uh, sure to be cited properly. So let's go to uh, the, um, the, the, the use case, the test case of this presentation. Um, we deal with the emergency phase with the high impact volcanic hazard, in particular ash and gas clouds in the atmosphere that uh, um, are created during the eruptions. They are very dangerous because uh, the, for the aircrafts, uh, for the engines of aircrafts, uh, and also they have an impact on the climate change. So it's very important to detect the uh, ash and gas clouds and also to know the density and uh, the height and so on. And um, so I don't personally remember this uh, disaster of the 1989 due to the eruption of a volcano in Alaska, but I remember very well the eruption of, uh, so the massive dis uh, disruption of air traffic during the eruption of the Ayafialayogul volcano in uh, 2010. You see the black cloud here. So not only Europe, but most of the uh, Northern at the hemisphere was affected. So it's very important to, um, to detect the extent of this cloud. Um, for this purpose, we use, uh, among others, uh, the um, geostationary uh, satellite, the Severi data. Uh, these satellites provide a lot of images per day. They are acquired uh, by ETA-NGV. Uh, so they are used to detect uh, um, SO2 and hash. We do it at Mount Etna. Uh, near, uh, we have an operative system near real time. It's called MAST. It's been developed by us. So you see here two images of this cloud detection. And here is a screenshot of, uh, the, uh, of the system. So what have we have been done, doing is to create research objects for each eruption at Mount Etna. You know, we have many eruptions of Mount Etna, so we are not, uh, we don't get bored. And uh, we created these uh, research objects, uh, uh, aggregating uh, operative products, research products uh, using the ROHAB APIs. And full documentation of these APIs are here. You will have the slides later. And here are the main methods that we have been using. I try to go uh, here, I mean, um, uh, EGI uh, space. He, this is a notebook in which I load the uh, ROHAB uh, library in Python. So this is a notebook uh, to create uh, the research objects using so the, uh, the results of the um, mapping of the cloud of the eruptions of Mount Etna. So after some setting, uh, so here is very important. To, uh, this is the method to log in with the username and password. So once we are in, it's like we are in in the portal. And we can do, uh, we can check uh, uh, the list of the research objects. Uh, and um, after setting, 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 we can create a research object by setting all the uh, parameters like uh, the, the type of research object, the description, et cetera. Show metadata. So we already have a link of the research object that has been created. 
which is empty at this phase. So there are, um, so we can set everything basically, the list of folders we can check. And uh, I want just to show uh, the, uh, how the uh, resources are then added in the research object. So I can add an internal resource. So uh, like this resource is uploaded in the research object. Um, and here of course is the define everything regarding this resource or as an external resource, so by the link. And in this case, it's a video which is in YouTube that I'm going to show you as an example, et cetera, et cetera. So this is uh, very useful in case of repetitive, uh, uh, research, uh, re repetitive work, repetitive uh, research object. So in this case, for several eruptions. So going back to the uh, presentation, we can go here. I can show you an example of a research object of this uh, uh, eruption at Mount Etna last year. And here is all the content, the biblio, the, uh, the link to the bibliographic resources. And we can go to, uh, to see, sorry, this one to YouTube. Let's wait a moment. And, and this is the, yes, one of the resources or the video. And um, okay, as a, a last uh, slide, uh, I want just to uh, tell you about a collaboration with the DICE project. So within the infra EOSC call, uh, this work has been uh, carried out by Terra Due, in particular, one of our technical partners. So as super sites, we need to access long time series of data. So what have been done in the, for the super sites now, this, uh, the wall archive of Sentinel-1 data is available through DICE. And also Teradue developed a brand new algorithm that is taking this data and performing in SAR analysis that is uh, uh, described a little bit here. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Lisa. So if there are, uh, so I don't see question on the slide, or oh, I don't know if there are questions here, if somebody wants to, to join the discussion. I don't know if it's clear for everybody, the all the research object technology, I think it has been extensively presented yesterday. So in case uh, you, you missed uh, some bits because uh, it could be something new, for many of you, uh, I suggest that you also can see the presentation that was one, that was done yesterday where uh, all this technology was uh, presented as wrapper of information going from, from bibliography to algorithms to the data that is used so that this can be easily browsable and easily get used by, by, uh, by users and people that want to access that kind of research. Um, so let's say we can, I think we can move directly to Timothy if there are no, if there are no other questions. So Timothy, do, do you want to take, uh, do you want to take the screen? Sure. Yeah. Thank you. So wait, because I need, I need to introduce you clearly. So I'm going to write it. I'm, I'm going to read it. So you work as an associate scientist at Astron which is the Netherlands Institute for Radio Astronomy. And you run the Low Far Low Frequency Array Telescope, which is currently the largest radio telescope operating at the lowest frequency. And what your work is into this frame is to, what, what you are doing is to make radio astronomy data products from the Low Far available to the community from the project that you're working in, which is DICE. Yeah. I am correct because I've been reading from your bio. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, great. I leave it up to you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so I work on this um, this telescope um, called the Low Frequency Array, um, which is a uh, radio telescope. And um, this is a picture of the center of the radio telescope. And here you can see um, kind of these big patches of um, more shiny uh, things, which is actually uh, our highest frequency uh, telescope, and then the more sparse uh, arrays, which look kind of gray on this plot, 
um, there are lower frequency telescopes. And just looking at these in a little bit more detail, you can see actually how simple uh, these things are. So this one on the left um, operates at about um, a two meter wavelength. And it's a simple uh, bow tie shaped antenna um, in polystyrene with a tarpaulin over it. Uh, the other one, uh, the more sparse one, is basically a pole in the ground that's held up by some wires. And this can detect uh, radio waves up to 10 meters in wavelengths. Now, this telescope is centered in the Netherlands, but actually we have stations a little bit similar to the one I showed throughout Europe. And we actually have them up to 2000 kilometers apart. And this means this telescope can um, image the sky um, at an incredibly high resolution because the data from all of these telescopes is combined together, allowing us basically to, to get sub arc second scale imaging of the sky, which is comparable to an optical, uh, a good optical telescope. But because we're operating at such low wavelengths, we need these very long baselines in order to get the same resolution. Now this is, the telescope might look very simple in terms of kind of being holes in the ground and things, but it's really a software or data telescope. And each of these telescopes, or 52 of them, sends back three gigabytes uh, per second uh, to um, a, a central uh, computer in Kroningen. So our, our first problem we have with LOFAR is dealing with this absolutely extraordinary high data rate. The second issue with LOFAR is that this is the electromagnetic spectrum at the top of the plot here, well, and also the bottom. <laughs> and you can see that um, the frequency that LOFAR operates on the wavelengths um, between a couple of meters and 10 meters are actually the lowest frequencies we can observe from the Earth. And this presents a couple more problems as well. So when you look with, with LOFAR at the sky, here's a little movie that shows what you see. Now, if you look at the, basically, it's very similar to lying at the bottom of a swimming pool and looking up at the sky. And I'll just show that in these movies. The, the one on the left is perhaps the more interesting one. But you can see that as you're looking at the sky, everything in the sky is moving around. And here, the scale with which we, these objects move is actually thousands of times the power, the resolving power of LOFAR. So if, if you were to example, look at a particular object, it would just wiggle all across the sky. Um, and you have to do very, very precise calibration in order to make these objects um, stay in the sky and stay in the same place and kind of remove the ionosphere from your data. So that's the second problem of LOFAR is that, um, is that we have this very complicated data processing chain to remove the influence of the ionosphere. So what kind of are the capabilities of LOFAR? Well, in four hours of observing, we can observe about 13 square degrees, uh, which is about 65 times the extent of the moon. Um, so in about 10, 12,000 hours, we can actually observe the whole northern sky. Now, with each of these four hour data sets, we need to create an image um, which requires quite complicated data processing. But even this image alone contains 14 billion uh, independent pixels. Um, this uh, data size that we need to process in four hours is about 10 terabytes. And the amount of compute required to process it is up to a quarter of a million CPU hours. Um, but because, um, well, basically because of this, these kind of capabilities, and because LOFAR is such a large telescope and it's got so many, so large collecting area, um, almost everything it does is new. Um, so it's been around for about eight years, but um, throughout that period, almost everything it's done is new. For example, about 90% of the objects it typically detects have never been seen before. And this has allowed us to detect about 500, well, to, to, to publish about 500 publications from low far to date. This image on the right just shows one four hours of data from LOFAR, and this is looking at a region of the extragalactic sky, about 70% or 80% of the northern hemisphere is like this. And all of these objects you're seeing are actually uh, black holes, uh, and this is the jets of radiation uh, coming from a black hole. Um, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but basically the black hole is in the, is in the middle of each of these objects, and then it has two jets uh, that come out from each side. So through, through this project, we're trying to make LOFAR data more accessible. 
But this is just another image from Lopa. This is a star forming galaxy, star, star forming region in our own galaxy. Um, so we've got two ways we're trying to make this data more accessible. And one is just producing completely science ready products. Now, through one of the projects I work in, we have a project where we're mapping the entire northern sky. And through this project, we've been able to make 200 terabytes of completely science ready uh, products available. And to do this, we had to process about uh, 10 petabytes of LUFAR data. And we use probably about 10 million CPU hours to process this. And uh, through uh, the SURF data repository, uh, all of this data is available. And we've, we've really um, been fortunate to uh, make um, so much available, more than just the images available, but actually all of the data sets. So you can re-image them if you like to tailor them for your specific science case. Uh, there's catalogs of all of the sources and all of this type of stuff to try to make the data as scientifically valuable and usable as, as possible, because not all astronomers are so familiar with LOFAR. Uh, the other problem we have is that the LOFAR data size itself that we store in the archive is growing rapidly. It's currently at about 60 uh, petabytes, and it's growing by about seven or eight petabytes a year. Um, so we have another approach where we're trying to, where there's been some research to compress this data, basically. You can compress it and lose just a fraction of a percent of quality um, and by compressing it by a factor of four. So we're now going through all of the data and compressing it. Um, we're trying to um, not access the data quality, but assess the data quality. Um, so because currently the data is just in the archive and you have no idea if the ionosphere was very active or the ionosphere was very quiet during the observation. So trying to divide this as a, this as a diagnostic so a scientist can kind of be a bit more picky about what data they get. And we're also, because the data is split between several different sites in Poland, Germany, and uh, the Netherlands, uh, we're trying to provide local access uh, to that data so that you don't have to move these very, very large data sets around because that's obviously very time consuming and unnecessarily expensive. So just to summarize, um, so our project here is about adding value to the low-far to low data archives by kind of generating higher level data products and more close to science products. And this overcomes the challenge of the large data volumes and the really difficult and time consuming and very computationally expensive data processing. So this image kind of summarizes our efforts where the image at the top is data from LOFAR, uh, the, the kind of uncalibrated data that you get from the telescope. And the image at the bottom is after it's been processed with tens of thousands of core hours and um, several petabytes of data. Um, and the image at the bottom is obviously what we want to provide to our scientists. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, super interesting. Thank you. Um, are there any questions? I'm also checking on Slido. There are no questions by now. Anyone? Not in this moment. Okay. Uh, thank you, Timothy. Was okay. No, we have one person raising a hand. I don't know. Well, please talk. I don't know how how to. Anybody? Else? Yes. Thank you for the for the presentation. Just out of curiosity, um, is you mentioned the size of data. Um, one of the challenges I would assume would also be um, the format of the data. So, is there any? consideration as to how make the, for the, 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 the data formats is essentially usable in the long term or to choose data formats that are going to be useful for tools in the future. Mm, yeah, so most radio telescopes kind of use a consistent format. So we, we use the same uh, format as telescopes in America or Australia or whatever. And this does evolve over time a little bit, but um, yeah, if we wanted to change the format of our archives, it'd be quite complicated and quite time consuming, but we're, we're using the latest kind of all, all, the, all the latest um, um, you know, properties of, of our like, data format to make it as compatible with various different software packages and things like that. And future telescopes are intending to use the same format as far as I'm aware. If that answers your question. Any other? Okay, so, well, Federica, I think it is your turn. 
Thank you. Microphone. Uh, so we are we are working together again in the Relight project. I think this is a. So you've been introducing yourself yesterday already, but I mean uh, Federica is working at Siena Risma in Bologna. Uh, she's a data marine data scientist, and uh, the work that you've been we've been doing here a lot together is about uh, it's about bathymetry and marine cartography. But I think that here you are going to present something which is more uh, interdisciplinary as a as a use case, and this is getting back a little bit. To that kind of technology that we were uh, discussing before about uh, those research objects, about the possibility of compressing the, all the information into uh, an entity, something that can be used and shared. And this allows different communities to under, understand each other pretty better, I think. This is, this is the gap, this is the bet that we've been doing, you know? into reliance. So I leave it to you so that you can show what is uh, this interdisciplinary use case that you've been working on during the project. Uh, you can share your screen, I guess. Okay. 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 So thank you, Fulvio, for the introduction. Wait, wait a second. Yeah. All black. No, no, yes. Okay. Perfect. Okay, good. So thank you for the introduction. And yes, I'm going to present these case studies on the focusing on interdisciplinary research to better understand how these reliance services already presented yesterday by me and Danny and today by Elisa could help enrich a real interdisciplinarity. Before going to the demonstration and the specific case study, I want to uh, focus on the concept of the research life cycle, and in particular on the concept of reusing that is providing an incremental increasing of knowledge. Because in the research life cycle, we start from the ground and hypothesis of a specific experiment, of a specific result and data, and specific conclusion that could be reused for another hypothesis, other assumptions, and creating new knowledge, new conclusions, and new publication. So how are we going to, uh, let's say, in, in foster this reusing of results from different communities to reach a common uh, and to solve a common hypothesis and background? So first of all, as Elisa already said, in the Reliance project, there were three different communities. The sea monitoring one that I represent, DigioASA, that was presented very well by Elisa, and the atmospheric and climate modeling that was introduced yesterday by Annie. So the sea monitoring community in particular is working on marine eco on uh, three different uh, specific fields. First of all, trying to understand the influence of climate change on ocean circulation, seawater chemistry, and biogeochemical cycles, on marine ecosystems and habitats and their ecology, and uh, about natural and anthropogenic factors that are impacting economically and socially on coastal system and deep sea environments. The hair monitoring community on the other side is working on hair and is working on hair system modeling to study the impact again and to study the climate mitigation and adaptation together with geoengineering and monitoring. So let's see that these two communities can meet for solving some specific problem, problem facing and working on water and on hair. So um, what about uh, uh, the multidisciplinary case studies uh, that we uh, faced in Reliance? In Reliance, uh, we were working uh, about the, the impact on COVID lockdown, uh, the, the impact on coastal environment during the COVID-19 lockdown. From our point of view, we were studying in particular the evolution of the anthropogenic stressors on the marine water quality, in particular in the Laguna Venice and in the North Adriatic, in order to understand how stopping all activities, all humans' activities, and it, it was the case uh, during the uh, COVID lockdown uh, in, in 2020, and uh, what happens to the environmental parameters. 
the marine community uh, was working on the water parameters, but what about the air quality during the, lo the COVID-19 lockdown? Are there any correlation with the water quality? So this is the question that we had at the time. So Reliance helped us to connect the two communities and to answer this specific scientific question. Let's see how. So let's see the tools that are really helping us for this issue. I'm going to show you this, uh, this video. So uh, the Reliance services, one of the Reliance services uh, um, is the text mining. And in particular, I show you this uh, um, recommendation service. The, the so-called collaboration spheres. Here you see the different services on text mining that you can find on the website. Let's have a look uh, on the collaboration sphere to see how it works and how the collaboration sphere are able really to connect different communities on a specific scientific issue. For example, in, uh, in, in the specific environment, in the research objects field, uh, you can write a, a keyword, so, so something that you want to look for. In particular, here we wrote snapshot. Snapshot is the project that was facing the COVID lockdown, the impact on coastal waters. And here, uh, just writing snapshot, we find a, a, a specific research object that is analyzing the water quality uh, on the northern Adriatic Sea through the usage of this aqua, 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 uh, aqua alta platform in Venice. Uh, but the question was how uh, the scientific community related to any, so the scientific community on the air quality is also facing the COVID lockdown impact. Just uh, using the any uh, account and uh, uh, dropping this research object, a, a name inside the collaboration sphere, here, you see the research object that are related to her. And we found this research object that is uh, facing the lockdown on air quality over Europe. So it was very interesting to put the two research objects together and to compare the water quality with the air quality. So let's have a look to the research object made by uh, me and, and Giorgio. And uh, uh, what we did was to merge the two different research objects and reuse the Jupyter notebook created by Annie for analyzing the, um, the hair atmosphere quality, the Jupyter notebook made by Giorgio for analyzing the water quality, and uh, in the content, so you have the two different research objects. Uh, you put this research object together, you reuse the different tools, and uh, you have a comparison on, um, uh, on the water quality and on the hair quality. Here you see the snapshot 2021 uh, case studies, and in the previous one, you are seeing the, um, uh, the, the water quality. In, this is the water quality in the Lagoon of Venice. I think we are a bit repeating the same thing here, but I want to show some, some results and, uh, and the possibility on uh, working on the um, Jupyter notebook uh, in this binder environment. What does it mean having a binder? It means that uh, you can uh, create uh, your own virtual machine for uh, running your own codes uh, without needing or restalling on, restalling on, different mach on, on, on your machine um, uh, different kind of libraries. It is extremely useful and uh, it um, makes you available uh, the, the different, uh, let's say, library that you commonly use. In this particular case studies, for example, we were using particular algorithm to analyzing the weather quality. Uh, here you see how the Jupyter notebook works uh, and uh, uh, the different codes uh, and uh, the creation on the, um, what we did was to load first uh, uh, the results of the research objects from any so from the water uh, the air quality community then we loaded the research object from us the uh, water quality community and we uh, made a comparison among the two research objects so uh, thank you very much for your attention. And uh, if you have any questions, I'm here. Thank you, Federica. Eight minutes. Perfect. <laughs> Grazie.
Uh, I don't know if this has been raising uh, some interesting uh, some interest from you. If, if there are any questions, I've not been seeing questions on uh, Slido. But if you want to raise your hand now uh, for questions, uh, I think which was a I don't know I don't. So how how was uh, you know how was facilitated by your research object at the end of the loop? I mean, as a close of your research, what were the main difficulties that you had, and what was the added value of using uh, this technology for you? Okay, first of all, this technology and uh, in particular the first usage of the collaboration sphere enabled us to find uh, researchers from different fields. Because otherwise, uh, uh, the community very often works on, uh, you know, specific silos, uh, specific journals, uh, uh, knowing uh, specific people, uh, and it's very difficult to to work and to reuse, uh, um, let's say, uh, research and experiments. Uh, yes, there is a distance uh, among the communities. Even if, of course, the environment, uh, <laughs> it's uh, it's not something distant. So water and hair are in contact. And of course, uh, are influencing each other. So I think that the possibility of having and a research object uh, uh, encapsulating a complete research research life cycle from a different community that uh, is interesting also for our community enable us to put these communities together and really um, uh, giving these incremental factors uh, to increase the knowledge. So coming back to the first slide, what is the research? object is doing is to really making people reusing the studies, the conclusions, the publications by someone else, not specifically in your fields, not specifically in your community. And I think this is a really, a really um, important added value and is a real uh, a good services uh, uh, for putting this community together and uh, understanding some specific scientific questions. Mm -hmm. Technically, of course, uh, uh, you have the services of, uh, you have the possibility of uh, uh, downloading the data, of reusing specific Jupyter notebooks. Uh, uh, on, but the most important, uh, uh, from my point of view, is, is the tool. So the fact that you really are able to merge uh, different experiments uh, uh, that uh, otherwise uh, uh, are never in contact. Okay. I hope I was clear enough. <laughs> Me, yes, but I know the projects. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, so. Okay, uh, so thank you very much. Uh, there, is a, there is a break now. So I would really like to thank uh, Elisa, Timothy, and Federica for your time and for your presentation. I think, uh, so you can stop sharing your screen. Okay, I think there is a, okay. So yes, we will be back at 10 o'clock. So you have uh, 10 minutes for your coffee and uh, we will go for the next session that is going to be chaired by Davide shortly. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, and uh, welcome to the next session. It is um, experiences from early adopters uh, approaching European Open Science Cloud, uh, the Alliance Open Challenge for Sustainable Development. And uh, today, uh, we're very lucky we have a wide array of uh, speakers uh, that come from different backgrounds. And unfortunately, uh, we have time in time, so we have 45 minutes with seven different speakers. Uh, so I would recommend to stay in time and, uh, and uh, yeah, and to make it well and quick. Um, I'm David Poleto. I'm a part of the team of uh, Reliance Project and um, I'm an international consultant and under this uh, specific activity, I work with uh, Alpha Consult UK and also the task leader networking with epistemic communities and capacity building within which this session is being built upon. Um, so today, as I said, we have a wide array of uh, speakers and not just the researchers, but also practitioners and operators uh, within the, the educational sector. Um, plus, we have also Horizon 2020 narrative of how a project can use um, European Open Science Cloud and case in point rely on services in order to uh, share information, knowledge, data, etc. as you will, you will see. 
so um, well, I would like to dwell upon too much on the introduction, and would like to give the floor to to our guests, in particular to start with the first uh, uh, two guests that are related to the geohazard and disaster risk management uh, uh, issue area. And I would like also to uh, thank Elisa for the work done in these two years in order to support the, and uh, her specific uh, uh, field of science, uh, these early adopters. Would like just to say the last thing that services without users are useless services. So our work was really made to focus upon to get new people on board with these services. And I uh, hope you appreciate it and, and uh, the contribution we're going to provide you with. Okay, so um, here we have uh, a, a guest from uh, Ecuador, um, uh, Santiago Eguaiza. Santiago, you, you are a physicist uh, working at the Instituto Geofisico Escuela Politecnica Nacional in Quito, in Ecuador. And you are going to introduce something about volcanoes, how you use the reliance services and uh, how you feel that, um, I mean, how, how these reliance services help your research in this very specific topic, and uh, in particular in remote areas uh, as, such as in the uh, investigation of the World Volcano in the Galapagos. So um, thank you very much for your time, and thank you also for being here with us, uh, also considering the time gap we have, so it's uh, four in the morning there. And so the floor is yours, uh, Santiago, and please. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hey, well, um, second. yeah, thank you very much for the invitation for to share the experiences with the Reliance uh, resources. Well, I'm going to expose about the hazard monitoring of remote volcanoes in Ecuador using the Reliance uh, services. Well, uh, my name is Santiago. I work in the Instituto Geofísico de la Escuela Politécnica Nacional. I am from Ecuador, uh, from South America. <laughs> this is my email of contact. Uh, well, uh, thank you for the support of the IGPN, the Escuela Politécnica Nacional, and the Geohazards Super Science and Natural Laboratories. Well, the main activities carried out with the Reliance Services is is that we can work with our simulation of modeling the formation sources in any place of work, office, home, and travel. We can use scripts, software, and other resources from national and international collaborators. The services are useful for routine monitoring of volcanoes and for rapid sharing of scientific products in case of emergency. Well, in Ecuador, we have a lot of volcanoes. Uh, so we, we, are, we were using the, the software of modeling previously but now with the new with the reliance services we have the some advantage benefits that we can work online and two new benefits that that are new for us well uh, we can see in the right uh, a map of the galapagos island and location of world volcano in the north of the isabella island galapagos islands have volcanoes with significant rates of deformation we focus in this case on the world volcano in the Isabel Islands. It's a very far away site, hence remote sensing measurements are very useful to detect crustal deformation. We investigated the pre as in eruptive phase following the 2022 20, eruptive activity. By analyzing Sentinel-1 data, we topsar at acquisition mode. The outcomes were then used as input to infer the volcanic sources parameters such as position, shape, and volume variation. Yeah, so, yeah, okay. So, uh, we can use computational and storing resources that are made available to the geohazard community. Uh, for example, in the, uh, thank you, for, thank you for, for uh, the AGI resource. We can use the volcanic and seismic resource source modeling. We have some packages as we can see, the, the WSM, the Matplotlib, and ETC packages that we can use for the modeling process. Okay, we can see now the a notebook that we use for the analysis of World Volcano in the inside analysis and modeling. So we have the code, we have the packages, the plots, 
the results. Uh, we can see now the, the volume of the, the formation source that is important about the potential of eruption. Okay, the research outcomes is that we detect deflation in the pre-eruptive and in the eruptive phase and the opinion of the diagram field in the eruption. We model the satellite data with a notebook in the EGI. So we see now the plot, one of the results. We have the data, the model, the blue color is the deflation after the eruption, excuse me, about the, related to the eruption. And the yellow is uh, some region in the with inflation. On the right, uh, we see the residual that indicates a difference between the real, the observed data and the model that uh, we have a minor difference. The final considerations and remarks are that modeling of the formation sources in Ecuadorian volcanoes is possible using resources shared by colleagues. Real-time modeling, excuse me, well, real-time modeling is useful for the, to share a, 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 the products in, with a quickly response that the community, community needs. Thank you for your attention and, and thank you very much. An invitation. <clears throat> Thank you a lot, Santiago. That's very interesting how this uh, European uh, developed, uh, if you like, European Center developed, um, um, you know, services can be a service of everybody on this planet. So it doesn't matter where we are. So, and that's very interesting how you know, <clears throat> computational expense investigation uh, can really put a, a serious test to the, the research infrastructure or certain facility in countries. So, I'm very happy that uh, we could be of use of your research by, by Reliance uh, Services. So this is some, something we can also explore in the future. Um, and thank you for the five minutes. It was the perfect time. Okay, Santiago, I will pass to the, to the next uh, speaker so that maybe we can leave the question and answer uh, at the end, if you don't mind, uh, considering the, the time strain, uh, constraint. So, um, so, uh, Alessandro, uh, Alessandro Saretta, I would like to give the floor to you now. It's, uh, Alessandro is a researcher at the uh, CNRIRP, uh, Research Institute for Geo Hydrological Protection in Italy, and he has a specific uh, presentation uh, regarding experience of using ROA for optimizing management, sharing, and preservation scientific outputs in the, in the area of disaster risk management. Um, so welcome, Alessandro, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Avide, uh, for the presentation and also the support in the previous month from, uh, from you and uh, Elisa especially. So um, I've been already introduced and uh, going straight to, to the point, this presentation is it's a, a simple use case, uh, probably much simpler than the, the examples that we've seen before, but uh, I think it's quite complementary uh, in the sense that uh, previous presentations were more domain specific. This is a more a general topic and it's useful, I think, to reinforce some concepts uh, already presented, especially also from um, Federica before. Um, and we wanted to test being uh, having no previous experience in the Reliance software platforms uh, stack. Um, so we wanted to try and use a row hub and research objects as a, as a mean to organize in, in a better way um, and make available uh, outputs related to research projects and research activities. In this sense, uh, we uh, use the, the, the basic and data centric uh, research objects because there are many types uh, of them. And uh, we, we have a, uh, in, in the most classic way, trying to uh, collect elements in a research object so that the, they can be uh, well uh, presented, organized, not only for, uh, for other people, but also for the researcher himself. And uh, I have to say that we've also started to uh, carry out some work for executable and workflow centric objects, but not yet developed. So in, in a nutshell, uh, what we have done was to uh, collect already available research activities, outputs, uh, and make them uh, described and accessible through uh, Rohab through a research object. In this uh, specific case, so that there was a scientific article 
published somewhere, uh, a GitHub software repository where the code used for uh, the publication of the article was uh, uh, collected, presented. Uh, there was a Zenodo um, uh, where, where the data supporting the, the paper and the code referencing the GitHub repository where it was stored. And then uh, some graphic summaries of, of the research. So all of them were sparse along the, the web in different places. And we wanted, to, uh, we tried to have them collected in one place. And after that, you see in gray uh, some other elements that we are playing, let's say with a Jupyter Notebook and Rohab APIs to make the workflow coming from the data to the uh, research output um, uh, complete. And so we, we're going to finalize this. Uh, also to say that this is not a one-shot uh, collaboration with this community, but I think it's, it's something that can grow in, in, uh, in time. So as a final consideration, um, so the research object, it's probably not a totally new concept you know, for organizing research. You can do it maybe in a, in a description page on GitHub or in Zenodo, but the, the, the graphic interface and the, the way it, it's implemented, it adds simplicity and standardization to the process. And the use of DOIs, as, um, digital um, uh, identifier for, for this is a really a standard and transparent way to make together research uh, building blocks uh, that are usually sparse uh, uh, along the web. In, the, in this perspective, probably uh, uh, just a note, uh, the way or how Rohab uh, will be used in this perspective also depends on the, how to strengthen some features like data storage, computer power, flexibility. But uh, it seems to me a very good approach and uh, can grow as much as the community and the researchers is growing with, with those type of uh, elements. That's all. And thank you again for the invitation and for listening. <clears throat> thank you very much, Alessandro. It's very encompassing and gave a, a broad vision of the other value that this service can provide. I mean, you're part of the DRM, uh, I would say, field because this is where you work. But in reality, as uh, we have seen through your presentation, and going to see the other presentation, the coming ones, see all yes. these, really, uh, you know, the services are really uh, broad and can be used by all different kind of communities. And uh, in particular, now we'd like to shift to, so thank you again, Alessandro. I would like to shift to, to the next of like dimension that we, we are going to investigate more about the marine litter pollution monitoring researching. And, uh, and we have uh, Professor Teresa Cecchi here, who's uh, is a professor in high school and one of the, I would say, most uh, renowned and uh, I would say for sure, oldest school of, uh, of Italy. Um, and very happy to have a professor from, from, from the high school who's also a researcher, by the way with an uh, excellent laboratory, part of the team. So, uh, Teresa, welcome on board. And uh, Thank so you, Davide. And uh, yeah, the so microplastic monitor methodology in seawater. So. Thank you, Davide. Okay, let's go to the uh, main point. We are going to present a kind of a quick start guide to microplastic analysis. And so we will focus on microplastics monitoring methodology in seawaters and um, well the uh, main activities carried out with the reliance services is the development of a workflow research object within the framework of the row hub the rationale beyond this research object is the harmonization of pre-analytical and analytical steps for microplastic quantification and characterization. And actually, this is an urgent research need because the wide gamut of experimental outputs in this field, in this research field, is due probably to a kind of variegated and sometimes exotic qualitative and quantitative procedures. So our aim was to develop a research object focused on presenting a tentative microplastic sampling uh, methodology and in seawater, obviously, environment. And uh, let's go. Okay, here you see the um, screenshot of our, of our research object, and you can also find the, the link here. And uh, okay, any uh, analytical procedure 
comprises at least four phases, four stages. The first one is sampling, and uh, the second one um, regards the, all the pre-analytical steps, and the third one is the real analysis. Um, as regards sampling, sampling, we sampled three water samples uh, from Venice, from the most iconic uh, uh, places in the city center, so St. Mark, Saint Mark, Mark uh, Basin and Rialto B Bridge, and four from Croatia in December 2021 and June 2022. Five liter of water, five liters of water were sampled in stainless steel jerry cans. So we go to the pre-analytical steps. These, these steps are crucial to obtain meaningful results. First of all, we have a cascade sieving's sieving with the uh, nested sieves with the um, uh, mesh size with um, always decreasing mesh size. And then we have the digestion step with hydrogen peroxide and uh, um, to, to do what? To um, be sure that all the micro particles are actually microplastics. You know that the hydrogen peroxide would not, um, would not uh, uh, impair microplastic, but would digest organic material. And the third step is filtration. Uh, after filtration, you have all the microplastics on the uh, filter. Then we go to the analytical results and uh, the analytical steps. Um, uh, we have a dual modality. Actually, we can use optical microscopy and nanoparticle analysis. Uh, from this workflow, you go to the raw data and your first results. Uh, results concerning microplastics are microplastic per liter, so a kind, kind of counting microplastics, but you can also categorize microplastics according to their size, morphology, and color. And then on the other side, you have the possibility to count nanoparticles. So let's see um, our, um, uh, how can I say, our conclusion. Most microplastics are fibers. They come from our plastic clothes. Um, most of them, the concentration, the most, uh, the highest concentration we observed is in the most iconic location in, Ven in Venice city center. And uh, this is something that we have to reflect on. The concentration of nanoplastics is circa 10 billion times higher than microplastics. This means that this pristine research field concerning nanoplastics should be further investigated. So, our final consideration after using the Reliant digital assets are as follows. First of all, well, we have the possibility to combine the approach of research-oriented teaching in an educational lab. My, my, I work in a school, in a secondary school, with the European network of scientists in the uh, microplastic research field was a plus. Secondly, we empowered digital natives with sustainability competence through project-based learning and citizen science. And the research object is conducive to developing students' talent and engagement and to facilitate the exchange of data, the cooperation and knowledge sharing. So uh, another issue, the research object tags help retrieve this workflow or other workflow, other research objects and helps networking that is crucial in collaborative research to harmonize the procedures. So my final consideration, actually the reliability of knowledge that we extract from raw data need, needs an assessment tool different from the like concept featured with the five-star like rating. 
uh, they are open to any users. And this is um, from, um, from one hand, this is a plus, but this can also be a disadvantage because science cannot be voted as liked or disliked. I mean, thumb up or thumb down. Another question, browsing the overall database of the research object, in particular tags, can be improved as the scroll window should display all possible options. So with this final consideration, I thank you for your attention and I leave the floor to David again. Thank you very much, Teresa, for all this also the, the feedback received because I mean, there's always room to improve, and uh, we're very happy when we uh, we receive some some critics and that are constructive for in in this sense, and uh, and also it's a very it's very important uh, what you said about the you know how this service can also be in support of uh, teachers like you that also have yeah. laboratories, that's uh, important laboratories with, uh, and then you have a, you conduct important uh, analysis. In particular case here about microplastics, but we know that there is not a consolidated methodology, and and, and I think it uh, you know it's a, it's a new frontier to investigate and and to 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 involve other researchers and also through through Reliance Service or European Open Science Cloud uh, Service. So uh, well, I know that you have to go back to your uh, yes, students, uh, <laughs> okay. Teresa, and thank you very much for having taken the time to be with us and contribute. Okay, thank you, Davide. Bye. Thank Bye, you, everybody. Ciao, Bye. ciao. Um, so um, now we're going to the next speaker, also a colleague from the Milestone Project, is uh, Luis Viela, who is a researcher at the Interdisciplinary Center of Marine Environmental Research from the University of Porto, the CIMAR, CIMAR UP. And um, basically, uh, you is you you research uh, you too you I mean you, I combine you with Teresa in a way because you also focus in on the microplastic analysis in the in the water in the coast um, water of the of the Portugal in particular this uh, investigation include also the rivers Ave and Douro and uh, well we're all keen to know a bit more about this you is your experience with uh, our services okay thank you David for the introduction. Are you seeing my screen? No, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, good morning to all. Uh, I have already been introduced. And uh, I'm a researcher. Wait, okay. Okay. My name is Luis Vieira. I'm a researcher in CIMAR. That is a research institute in the University of Porto, Portugal. I take the opportunity here to, to thank for the kind invitation to the organization and opportunity to present the, this is the, our first project as early adopters. And it is entitled, okay, sorry. And is it, it is entitled Microplastics in the Northwestern Portuguese Coast. So that is a research object that links research to public awareness. So this research object was developed using the, the raw platform as a research object. It was linked by from the beginning to three main scientific areas, applied science, ecology, and environmental research. And it was designed to be a long-term collaborative research. So linking the field work to the society. And the last version is already linked to a community, marine litter and plastics pollution. And we take the opportunity also to create another community, more focused on thinking about this microplastics paradigm. So uh, we take the opportunity to invite our colleagues from the existing community also to join us in this very fresh uh, topic. It is also important to highlight that uh, this, uh, this research object was developed in the scope of a very inspiring and interesting, interesting project that is Maelstrom. We have here the coordinator, so Santina will talk in more detail about this project in a few minutes. So this research object is based in uh, four main objectives. So to promote collaborative research, and for that, we started with the two estuaries in the north of Portugal. 
and uh, uh, um, for this we started to 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 work on data from the microplastics monitoring in this in these locations uh, with this knowledge we involve the community and uh, we are also contributing for strategic networking and at a bigger scale at a wide scale to to new removal marine litter removal technologies in fact one of them uh, bubble barrier in the scope of maelstrom will be or is being implemented in uh, the Ave river estuary this first estuary in the picture this uh, research object is at least linked to 10 metadata topics and here some captures about the structure of this project uh, some uh, examples of microplastics identified in these estuaries the protocols and methodologies used and also some of the results comparing the microplastic in both estuaries microplastic characterization and with this knowledge to try to identify possible sources of these emergent contaminants and uh, together with this joint knowledge also involving community with dedicated activities trying to change attitudes and behaviors reducing significantly input of these uh, contaminants in the estuaries Finally, our considerations about the experience using these platforms. Myself, I consider the ROAB a very user-friendly platform. Uh, very positive uh, is to link, possibility to link to other research objects in a, a collaborative work in open science concepts. And uh, another positive topic is that, uh, that it, it allows different assess modes. So the more classical, that is open data, but also collaborative work with more closed or temporarily closed groups. And the two important things for the evaluation of the projects and especially for the researchers is that this platform is also compatible with already published uh, scientific publications. And it produces a dedicated reference. It's very important, not only for the visibility of the projects, also contributed to their objectives, but also increasing citation scores for the evaluation of uh, the researchers. So my experience, the experience of the group was very positive, and we hope to also to, to, to start very soon another research object in this platform. So I think that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Luis. Very quality presentation, and you know the, the other value you, uh, you brought with us. You know, early adopters is very, very high, and we all appreciate it. And uh, and for sure, there'll be new research up that are coming. So <laughs> that's for sure. Yes, for sure. <laughs> thank you, Luis. Uh, thank you. And uh, yes, let's pass to the next uh, next guest, and we are going more into an interdisciplinary dimension. Uh, we. Uh, we take in COVID, I've seen also in the previous presentation, COVID has been, COVID lockdown in particular, being a sort of test bed for understanding how the health system I see, uh, reacts to uh, previous point to answer, et cetera. So we have just a, um, a couple of presentations, pretty interesting. Uh, one from uh, Dario, the, Dario Bertocchi, and uh, he's a researcher at the University of Udine and a lecturer of Kafoski University of Venice. And Dario is a specialist in uh, tourism. And in particular, uh, what happened in the in the small heritage side of Venice in the Lagoon in terms of uh, touristic flow, and then Paolo Franceschetti afterwards uh, uh, will investigate something else. So, but Dario, the floor is yours. For we have five minutes, and uh, we're curious to know about the tourist flow in Venice. Pre Thank you. Um, yeah. Thank you, David. Good morning, everybody. So, as really said, uh, I'm Dario Bertocchi, and I am working in Udine University and Kaposkri University in Venice, and uh, my speciality is, is uh, tourism, and uh, we, we, we work uh, especially for, like, in terms of cabin capacity and over tourism in destinations. So I wanted to present how we use uh, Rohab for, for the case of Venice, uh, of course, you have seen already the, these pictures that uh, are already super famous of a uh, summer square uh, 
empty, completely empty, no tourism. Uh, and this is uh, for, for, for our like uh, research it was uh, actually not so bad point because it was, uh, let's say, a refresh, a reset of a system that was uh, uncontrollable and, and growing every, every, every day and every year. Uh, so we wanted to, to use and we use the Rohab, uh, not only as Alessandro mentioned before, like to try to have a common place where we can put literature, where we can put analysis, where we can put uh, other research uh, in term, uh, regarding Venice, but also for, uh, for a common database. Because usually, especially in tourism, data are open, but not in this uh, kind of uh, geographical level, because usually we have a municipal, uh, municipality level of data, and we wanted, uh, let's say, uh, going deep into the only the historical center of Venice, so only the fish, only the, the main areas. So we ask uh, with some difficulties uh, to have this data of pre and post uh, COVID. And when finally we, we have it, we, we wanted to share this data, of course, in uh, because they, they're open with, with the community. And so this is like one of the first activity that we wanted to do and we do with the Rohab. So uh, putting this data for, for everybody. This is a, should be simple for researchers like sharing data, but sometimes, especially in Italy, especially in Venice, that the, the, the problem of over tourism is a critical problem. Data related to tourism are not also so open. So what we wanted to, to, to use this data is to link the, the tourist flows with other information regarding, especially as Teresa already presented. So we try to, 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 to mix our, 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 uh, our uh, research um, with uh, waste production or pollution levels or microplastics uh, information that we call, they, they collected, uh, let's say, regarding Venice. Uh, Rohab is, is super simple. To, to update so we can update our database uh, in, we, with new data of, of this year, but also we are adding other geographical levels of, of the data. And, and inside the um, Ro, uh, Rohab, we wanted to open a thematic group re, re, regarding tourism and sustainability, not only social sustainability, but of course also environmental sustainability. So this is like a, uh, our our project that we uploaded and we we put it some data we put it already some uh, some simple analysis to see that the the tourism the last uh, the last year's growth so we had the information from 2017 and now we are collecting uh, 2016 and 2022 uh, and of course we have the the, the big stop of, of the the covid period uh, we wanted to to analyze which were the, the impact of the, the of this stop of the pandemic uh, uh, crisis on Venice. So uh, after some analysis, we 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 came up uh, as a minus 53 percent of tourism between the, the 2019 and the last last year. So uh, those are simple analysis uh, that we wanted to use to do what. To study the effect of this stop on the environment, because tourism is not only measured as, uh, let's say, uh, tourist flows, so people visiting the, the destination, but also all the uh, facilities that are working in tourism. And we, you already saw probably these uh, these images, uh, like before and uh, during COVID and during the, the lockdowns, and also the nature changed, uh, the lagoon environment changed because where there wasn't uh, the, the, the traffic boat as before. Because uh, we're working also in terms of tourist carry capacity, and usually the carry capacity is uh, measured in terms of social and economical uh, point of view. We wanted also to uh, analyze the environmental sustainability of tourism. So this is like a, why we wanted to upload this data and try to combine with the environmental data as a microplastic uh, as an example. And um, 
And with this data and the combination between uh, the, the, the flows and the environment, um, environmental information, we can have limits, limits of tourists to, to preserve the, the ecosystem and the natural ecosystem. Uh, and these limits can be also used in terms of charge and price. Uh, as you already know, probably uh, Venice is thinking about putting a fee for visitor for day trippers to come to visit Venice. So as in a similar way that we want, when we buy a flight, we can also add some price to, to be more sustainable and to, um, to try to balance the, the, the extra cost that we, we are doing when we are flying. And we can suggest to the municipality, thanks of this data, to, to uh, to let's say uh, save some money about the, the, the visitor fee in terms of uh, sustainable uh, tourism and in terms of to pre uh, preservation of the environmental. So what, what we, we find out that uh, uh, we, we find some interesting data set, not so common, not open, and we wanted to, to share. Um, we applied analysis and algorithm that we also un, uh, upload to, to our, our task. Um, and this is uh, like also use, useful to meet, to virtually meet some, some researchers that are working in the, same, uh, in the same topic or they has different data that can be joined and combined with our in terms of tourism flows in Venice. And uh, we, we personally think that this is kind of an academic research GitHub where we can put everything there, analysis, algorithm, data sets, and also other people can reuse or ask us how to they can reuse. And, and also because we are also working a lot with the European project and we have outcomes of old projects uh, that are finished I don't know, two, three years ago. Uh, we wanted to um, add these outcomes of this pro uh, project, the European project, and using these new data sets, uh, try to give a new life uh, or an afterlife strategy of outputs uh, of European projects. So, thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dario. Thank you very much. I mean, very interesting, and it's nice to see a, a social human scientist also on board. <laughs> and uh, so as I am, and basically uh, there's a lot of comparison we can do with this data and uh, with the air quality of Venice, the, the water quality of Venice. And as Paolo Francesetti is going now to present also the um, marine litter pollution types of macroplastic and microcontaminants in the lagoon. So uh, there is a, a work on his making, so in progress, and we hope also with the support and leadership of uh, Federica and Giorgio for CNR ISMA, we can uh, further develop this concept. Okay, so thank you again, Dario. And uh, I'd like to give the floor to Paolo Franceschetti, who's an environmental scientist, a PhD. And uh, I would say practitioner, Paolo, from uh, the industry sector, but also as from nonprofit sector. And uh, so Paolo now is also cooperating and uh, working in a, a project called you know, Plastic as Horizon 2020. And, Part of the activity has been somehow uh, taken from uh, from the monitoring of this project, but not only. Uh, so, Paolo, the floor is yours, and thank you. Good morning, everybody. I hope uh, that you can uh, see my presentation and they also heard me. I'm going to introduce uh, our um, research. First of all, uh, the main uh, activities uh, that we carry out uh, with uh, Reliance uh, Services, uh, we create uh, our own in uh, our hub for one reason. We are, as David said before, uh, a partner that uh, in the InnoPlastic project that is our Horizon 2020. And we are, um, we are collecting data about the macro litter in uh, the Lagoon of Venice in different ways. But in the same time, so in this area, there are a lot of other association, environmental association, research institutes, and so on, companies that are doing something similar, but still now they that are not related. They are, um, is not present a common database. 
So our, our hub could be a really interesting point to share data, to have database with the same information in the same format and to help who is going to do, for example, citizen science, like some environmental association. And um, the data that we are going to collect and we create in the, uh, our RO are information like uh, the quality and the type of uh, litter classification, the quantity and geolocalization. And also we add some photos to have a better understanding about what we are going to monitor. The data set is an Excel file continue, uh, in, with continuous uh, upload. And uh, uh, we are creating this database that can be shared. And here I put uh, the link if uh, someone uh, wants to see our RO. But let me move to the, some uh, first results. First of all, we have done a, a survey in, uh, about the floating litter in uh, the city center of Venice during 2016 and 2020. That uh, as uh, Dario said before, 2020 was a, a perfect year, we can say, for the researcher because it was uh, the baseline. Uh, have uh, an idea about uh, what is the city or what is the environment in general without uh, the pressure of tourists and also the people. Here, we during this uh, survey, we move uh, with a boat around the canals of uh, Venice and uh, we uh, take down all the registration of uh, liters, that were the floating liters and uh, the type of, of them. As we can see, we move from a density of 3.29 items each 100 square meters in the canals of Venice to uh, 0 0.52. So we had a drop, uh, a dramatic drop of plastic litter density during the COVID period. And uh, I put some, uh, I report here some uh, uh, data also. For example, we move uh, from 33% uh, of uh, cigarette boots uh, to 13. So is uh, related strictly with the people that move uh, around the, the city and uh, draw on, uh, on the floor uh, the, the cigarettes uh, and uh, that uh, waste goes uh, to the canals. But in the same time, so we, during the COVID period, uh, we increase uh, of, uh, a lot, the small piece of plastic. This what means that we are increasing the degradation of uh, the plastic is starting to, uh, to have a degradation. And so we have uh, pieces smaller and smaller moving after in the, the um, microplastic and nanoplastic. So that is very uh, bad situation for the environment. In the same time, oh, sorry if I interrupt. Can you yeah. do a bit quicker because I mean we're lagging behind in time. So if okay, you... sorry, sorry. We, I moved no, faster. No, no, I'm sorry. We're just uh, with the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you, David. And uh, the second the survey that we have done are about the the, the beach litter. Okay, stranded the litter in the lagoon inside the lagoon with uh, the site of Lazaretto Nuovo and outside in the in the beaches in front of the uh, Adriatic Sea. Here we can uh, see the, some results where the, the main things are, are plastics. And uh, you can see in 100 meters how many items that uh, we encounter. Sorry. And uh, we can see that there is a high the production of uh, plastics. And uh, so Venice is one of the most polluted place about microplastics. Uh, around the uh, Mediterranean for sure, and also the world. The third uh, res uh, survey that we have done was uh, like a sniffing of uh, uh, water to find the pollution that are uh, coming from uh, the water. And uh, thanks uh, to Teresa Cecchi that uh, spoke before also. And uh, we have done the year before in August 2019 and 2020. And uh, we can see here, the contaminants that are going down, uh, some one of them are uh, not so much decreasing, but the, the impact of the tourism and the, the boats are, was incredible about the water quality. Here we can see better the components, the chemical components on uh, the water. 
especially in real, uh, under Rialto Street uh, and uh, San Marcos. And the final consideration uh, that uh, we understand that, that we realize that the st uh, standard database uh, have a, with a continuous uh, monitor of uh, air pollution could be the solution to compare data that are really necessary. And also we want to increase the database uh, involving uh, two biggest uh, uh, environmental association like Lega Ambiente Wealth in Italy to uh, have data of uh, marine litter before 2020 to have a better comparison and understand uh, the, the COVID uh, uh, consequences. And uh, also we wanted to uh, engaging in trends from uh, macro litter to micro pollutants uh, and tourism uh, and have a correlation uh, and uh, speaks about uh, with uh, Dario, for example, that speak before us. Thank you so for this and uh, sorry if I run. No, no, thank you, Paolo. It's very interesting. Uh, actually, it's, uh, as I say, work in this making in progress. So for sure, we'll uh, interrelate with, uh, with Dario and uh, with other data. So. Uh, for the time being, we open a different research object. I'm not sure that we are going to converge, maybe with the computational, some computational capacity or graphics, uh, uh, you know, uh, displaying a different kind of uh, data set we have in through Jupyter notebooks or other kind of uh, instruments. So thank you, thank you, Paolo. And uh, I would like now to give the floor to uh, to Fantina Madricardo from CNR Ismar, who is the coordinator of uh, Milestone Project, Horizon 2020 project, focus on uh, <clears throat> marine litter monitor removal and circular economy. We've been working together since inception. And uh, so uh, this is very interesting because it's a project in relation to the services. So it's not individual or group of, of researchers. So um, Fantina, so the floor Hi. is yours. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you for the invitation. And now I'm trying to, uh, if I manage to share my screen. Uh, okay. If you see it, let me know. Can you see it? Yes, we can see it. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Um, so I was uh, asked to talk about the, um, the uh, I was asked to talk about um, the H2020 as an early adopter, and specifically, I will talk about uh, the case study of, uh, the, of the Maelstrom project. Maelstrom stays for Smart Technology for Marine Litter, Sustainable Removal and uh, Management. Um, and uh, here, I would like to just uh, spend a couple of words about the project. So the project is an H2020 project dedicated to uh, really um, to the focusing on the marine litter issue that we have seen today in many presentations about this. But um, so Maelstrom has uh, three main uh, activities, so to say. So one activity is um, focusing on the identif identification of marine litter accumulation hotspots in two pilot areas. One is the Venice area and one is the uh, Porto uh, area in Portugal, uh, and then we have a specific um, specific activity to develop uh, and um, implement uh, new technologies to remove the litter that we have uh, identified in the um, in the in the seabed and in the water column in the two pilot studies, uh, and then uh, we have uh, the litter that is removed uh, will be recycled and marketized. So produ we we produce new. Uh, pro new uh, products. The project has 14 partners, 14 European partners, and it, is, it represents really a, a fully multidisciplinary community since it, it uh, involves environmental scientists, uh, experts in robotics, engineering, uh, recycling, and circular economy. Because, of course, we want also to check uh, you know, the environmental uh, sustainability of all the technologies that we are developing. So I just want to show you an example of a, uh, of a research object that we developed during the, uh, during the project. Uh, we have uh, now uh, I developed together with Antonio Petrizzo and other people here an automatic, detec an automatic detection tool developed with the RGIS workflow uh, with the aim of really extract uh, marilita targets from the bathymetry that we collected from the seafloor. Um, so 
just to give you an example, this is the bathymetry. So this is the a map, so to say, of the seafloor. And what you see here uh, are, uh, you see here the, the zoom in are the uh, liter, macro liter on the seafloor. In this case, are tires uh, abandoned or a, a small boat uh, abandoned on the seafloor. And the, little, the workflow that uh, uh, we developed uh, identifies this, uh, these items uh, on the seafloor. And you can see uh, this was before the cleaning, because as I said, we have developed, I want to, just to see if I manage to, I don't manage to share um, my, uh, oh yes, sorry. Uh, I, we, we, are, we developed a big, uh, I just show you here a, a short video, um, a big seabed robotic cleaning platform um, that you can see here, I just skip a little bit, uh, and it consists of an underwater cable robot mounted on a floating barge, and it's dotted out of, uh, out of advanced control and artificial intelligence. You see here, this is the cable robot uh, operated with cables and has a gripper that can collect the, uh, the, the, the big items that we saw before, but it also can also uh, use the suction so you can really uh, um, collect also smaller items. I, I, you can see how it operates, but I want to skip because it's a bit uh, lo a longer video. I want to skip really the operation that we did in September 2022. We did the first clean campaign. You see, this is an area of the city of Venice, and this is our bathymetry with the one you saw before. And uh, this is the platform. And what we did uh, is because because the water water uh, turbidity of uh, the Venice Lagoon is very high, so it's difficult to use cameras. Uh, the cable robot really used the, um, uh, our data to, uh, to collect uh, the litter. You see here our data uh, and the target selection done by the robot. Uh, so what you saw before, it, it, it needs this to really, uh, you know, identify the item and, uh, and collect it with the gripper. I just let you see this. Uh, this is uh, one of the tire that we saw before in the uh, bathymetric map. It collects this. This is developed by our partners, uh, Technalia in, uh, in Spain, together with CNRS in France, and uh, of course the partner ST in Venice. You see here the logos. And you see this was one of the items that we identified with the, the Mariliter, with the Mariliter automatic detection tool, the research object that I showed you before. And you see the robot recovers the, the liter item, the, in this case, a tire that we saw before. So it's here as well. So I just skip this. And, and what do I want to show you is why is it important to have an automatic detection tool? Because then after the cleaning just recently, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we went and we collected again the bathymetric data to check exactly what, uh, what the, uh, actually the robot did in the, during the operation. You see the black spots are really the, the items collected by the, by the cable robot. And you can see that in the area that I was showing before, the tires are not there anymore. So we can really check and document after the cleaning what happened. Uh, and so also to do this, the you know, environmental assessment afterwards. So just a final consideration remarks. So the idea, our idea is really to uh, put uh, all the, I mean, start to put all the data collected during the Maelstrom project uh, the, from our data provider in, in a cloud that will be then related to the raw, raw hub and will end up in, uh, you use the services also that are developed in, in Reliance. But of course, there is an inertia of the different communities to adopt this new approach. Uh, Maelstrom, uh, however, is trying to make its data fair and also this uh, uh, EOS for Reliance services. But however, it's important to make the services easily accessible also to non-computer experts. And indeed, I think the research, the raw hub is now much more better accessible and uh, easy to use uh, because it, uh, it is really a, a very, very important um, opportunity to have an easy documentation of the whole uh, research life cycle in the European projects. So thanks a lot for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, Valentina. I think uh, it's very, very interesting, especially the, <laughs> the CBA cleaning platform is fantastic.
And um, actually, uh, we got to the end of this uh, session and what is left here, uh, the question and answer is the any uh, upcoming. Um, then uh, there should be, um, if I don't mistake, it should be a coffee break, right? And go to our next session, chair by Dale Robertson, lesson learned from use cases and uh, looking forward. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back uh, after the coffee break. Um, my name is Dale Robertson, and I'm very pleased to be uh, chairing this final session of this very, very interesting uh, workshop that we've been taking part in over the last couple of days. Um, so I take part in EOS Future. Um, I'm also one of the co-chairs of the, the many EOSC Association uh, task forces. Um, I work for the EGI Foundation based in the Netherlands, uh, although I'm based in the UK, actually. Anyway, this final session is lessons learned from use cases and looking forward. Um, so this is the opportunity to, to sort of stand back a little bit and, and take a look um, over the very, very interesting use cases that we've been hearing presented over the previous sessions. Um, and just to, to sort of take stock a little bit and look at lessons learned, look at what went well, look at what could have been improved and what's needed in looking into the future. So that's the, the type of questions that we'll focus on during this session. Um, now, just a quick word about timing. Obviously, um, we are starting 15 minutes later than we had um, originally been scheduled to do. So um, we'll see a little bit um, during the course of the next hour or so how that how that pans out. Um, if we can make up a little bit of time, fine, we will finish on time as planned at 12.15. But actually, um, it may be that <clears throat> in terms of what we've got planned for a discussion, it might be that it does take the full hour and a quarter <clears throat> excuse me, that we had originally planned for this session. So let's just see how it how it all goes. In terms of agenda for this session, um, what we're going to be doing first is to um, have the session chairs from each of the previous sessions. They will present briefly um, a slide that just gives the highlights from each of the previous sessions. And then once we've done that, that will set the scene nicely for us to move into our, our panel um, discussion. So I'll introduce the panelists when we begin the panel discussion. But first of all, um, I'd like to hand over to each of our session chairs, previous session chairs in turn. So um, I'm expecting then to, to take them in, in the turn that the sessions were, um, were presented. So starting with Charis, who um, is with us somewhere. And Charis, are you ready to share the slide that you've prepared about your session, please? Yes. Good morning, uh, by the way, from me too. Uh, share. Can you please confirm that you see the right thing? It's just coming now. Yep, that's it. Perfect. Yep. Okay. Um, so yeah, the, the session on the digital assets supporting the climate action uh, goal of the UN was the first one uh, yesterday morning. Um, it, uh, it, it included the presentation and demos for some cases of six use cases and from uh, four different projects. So you can see it here in the, in the circles. Uh, the first two use cases were from C-Scale, uh, the other two from Reliance. Then we had we saw one from EGIAs and at the end we saw one from EOS Future. And they all demonstrated um, how uh, how users how end users can um, exploit uh, available um, resources available services and resources of EOSC uh, in order to perform uh, research related to climate actions. Uh, we saw different topics starting from the first one. Uh, Milutin talked about the recovery of. Uh, the Amazon rainforest. Uh, we talked about changes between land and surface, monitoring the changes between land and surface. Um, then we went more um, into the uh, sea, sea pollution uh, and the Arctic sea ice forecasting. We talked more about uh, data space, the NS data space, um, and finally about the dashboard uh, from future use case for the state of environment. 
um, in short, because I need to keep it short from what I understand, um, I summarized here uh, the pros and cons, if you want, um, from, from the users. Um, and I would like to start with the cons so that I end up with the pros. Um, it was mentioned that in some cases, the initial setup of, of the resources and of their um, environment in any case uh, was challenging, which caused some delays. Um, but that uh, depends, highly depends on the experience of the user. So in some cases, some of the services can be a bit challenging for users that do not have uh, extensive technical experience. Um, because we're looking at climate uh, phenomena, the data volumes are typically very large and that poses a challenge itself because in some cases they have to be moved from one place to the other or they need to be loaded uh, into resources and that can cause a challenge. Um, and the other, um, let's say, yeah, um, Unclarity for now, I would call it is that the sustainability plans of services that have been created from projects are are not clear in all cases. On the pros, uh, users always have been mentioning that they really value the support that they get from the projects and from the experts that take part in these projects, and this is what makes uh, these projects. Um, um, so useful to the to the research communities, the services provide flexibility and control. Uh, they make debugging easier, uh, customization and parallelization easier. A uh, big advantage is that uh, they can share the results while uh, performing their research uh, through using um, services for sharing results like B2Drop, for example, it was mentioned in a couple of the use cases. And finally, the resulting workflows are easily reproducible and uh, upscalable, let's say, once they are made available to EOS. We had a nice question yesterday. Can really everyone uh, have access to these uh, services? And the answer is that yes, basically. So. Um, Thank you very much. That was for me the, the lesson that I've learned yesterday from my session and we can go on to the next one. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karis. Um, very interesting. And um, I'd like to go, I'm just checking, I don't see any questions in Slido, but um, the details have been reposted in the chat for Slido. So please do feel free to add any questions that you might have. Um, and now I'd like to hand over to John Cavaro. John, are you able to share your screen to share a slide with us? So do you see it now? Yes, thank you. Okay. Well, um, we gathered a few insights from our session. Uh, the first is that it can be challenging to expand the eco, uh, the EOSC ecosystem into some sectors and the health and well-being context is a good example. Some sectors like the, the pharmaceutical industry can be reluctant to join, and sometimes they give reasons that might be out of our control, like intellectual property concerns. But we need to remember that there is still much that is not out of our control. For example, open science tends to do open source, and potential users can be put off by the confusing number of licenses they need to manage. So we can still do our part by identifying and simplifying those things that are under our, our control in order to expand our ecosystem into new sectors. Another insight that came out of our session was that there are many paths to sustainability. So yes, it's true that many of the 07 projects are configured to offer services where you have charged for a circumscribed period of time, but, but that doesn't mean that researchers are abandoned after that. Researchers doing open science have many resources available to sustain their work, including, for example, national programs that are supported by the member states. And finally, everybody in the session emphasized that in the life sciences, their infrastructures can and should be applied across many subdomains, not just specific narrow ones. It makes them more robust. And one speaker noted that the best way to reach out across subdomains to get the visibility and awareness needed for them to start using the infrastructure 
was to get into the ESC marketplace. So the marketplace is an important amplifier of scope for the EOS digital assets and should be exploited as much as possible by the services to get themselves known across the ecosystem. So that's it from our session. Lovely, thank you very much. Really interesting. Thanks, John. And next we go to Paola. Paola, are you able to share your screen, please? Hi, hello, good morning. Let me just put this in presenter mode. Yep, that's perfect, thank you. Uh, okay, so, hi, good morning all, my name is Paula. And from the, um, the last session of yesterday, discovering services for open science, um, we showed, demonstrate our researchers as individuals or as members of a university alliance can easily access scholarly works and perform their everyday tasks in an easy, accurate and qualitative way along the services. So these are, um, this tag cloud just represents some of the um, most spoken words yesterday. And interoperability is one of them um, between services to, to, to facilitate communication and ultimately give the possibility to researchers to perform their tasks in one place, do it once and spread among the other systems uh, without the need of uh, replication. By the use of a persistent identifier and the disambiguation process, for example, every research output can now be visible in a wider and fair way along with multiple use that can be done with the metadata associated with uh, each resource. So data consistency and interoperability is one of the, um, represents one of the most important words for um, researchers. Uh, sorry. Uh, so this was one of the questions that were uh, left in Slido. How can we envision the added value for EOSC, uh, of EOSC for researchers? So with the services provided by um, Open Ed and, um, and the information uh, that researchers can easily collect, um, from Open Air Explore, um, having the Open Air Research Graph underneath researchers, we can see or saw by the use cases that were presented that researchers can access to open access scholarly works by um, installing, for example, the Open Science Lens add on uh, using Google Chrome on, my, on Microsoft Edge. Uh, how can they collect and search? for community-specific research outcomes by filtering and map uh, with the sustained development goals, identifying contacts for collaboration and expose uh, topic-specific information uh, by using uh, other facility from Open Air, like Open Air Connect Gateway, like the example we had from Utopia and University Research Alliance. And um, the use of persistent identifiers, the ORCID ID or the OI to easily link the research findings uh, with them and update resources for reporting purposes and build continuous update research CVs that showcase their open science activities. This was the main take home messages. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paola. Very interesting. In the interest of time, um, we'll go straight on now to Fulvio, please. So now we're on the sessions that took place this morning. Over to you, Fulvio. Okay, wait a second. Uh, I'm uh, I'm getting to it. Okay. Uh, right. So I can I can do this. Just a moment. Huh? So sharing my screen. Okay. That's fine. okay. That's it. Thank you. So okay, can you see it? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Perfect. So um, let's say I I I, I didn't have let's say the, the time really to go through the, 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 the lesson learned in terms especially of the first uh, session. What I can do is that I can try to summarize what has been my impression through the two. So I also ask Davide kindly to intervene on what I'm saying. So uh, during the first one, we have been talking about how the service can help researching researchers, which are managing data integration from different sources. Which is the cases of uh, which was the case of of uh, Elisa 
that is merging in C2 data and satellite data. And it's something that helps her to manage all these things in a, in, a, in a coherent way. Also, uh, what Timothy was telling us is the need about of those services to easily or to manage uh, what are immense amount of data for his own case. So we were talking about the, the fact of long-term archives, uh, necessity of extensive processing. So these are all dimensions that have to be tackled. And uh, I, which I think is the most interesting thing in general from this morning is the multidisciplinary scenarios. So what are the keywords? What are the things that have been identifying while the people were talking? So what are the boundaries and the constraints for a wider adoption? which is also, uh, it's, I think it's all at that level. I mean, uh, we, if we talk about research use, uh, what are the problems in terms of data format? What is the learning curve for the new communities? And then also another keyword that we have been talking about is the cross fertilization among different communities that was the good use case, the, 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 the use case uh, uh, explained by Federica, where you have two communities for earth science, that are trying to uh, put together their own data and they're trying to work together. So what are the boundaries and what are uh, the, the limits of this? So the, the, the very key point, and uh, I, I don't know if David is there, uh, is, is how to merge the work of different yes. science communities and how we can facilitate in the longer run this kind of, uh, of thing. Uh, David, the only thing is that uh, this is, the next slide is still on my computer, so uh, not on the same one that we were working uh, online. So uh, no, you no. can adapt, but, but I, again, the message, I think that the message for me, just to have a final word, is that now that from my session that was basically based on earth science, with David, we are going outside this kind of work. So David, what is your, your take? <laughs> Well, thank you, Fulvio. I think basically for me, uh, meeting you and going to Reliance Project was for, I was a, a early use myself. So I get introduced to this because I didn't know uh, services like this before. And, and I can tell you that a lot of efforts uh, should be also put outside the circle of people that are using that. And then, and then there is an effort that we have to to do to popularize this kind of uh, uh, services to make it more affordable and understandable. And this is the challenge we had since the beginning, if you remember when we approached the early adopters. Uh, people like me that never had the uh, opportunity to, to work with the services. And I can tell you, it's more difficult to explain them than using them. <laughs> so at the end, uh, so uh, you know when we start and we made several seminars uh, also in cooperation with UNESCO, ICTP, with Marco, you know that was it was heavy. But then when we saw the service and, and we had a very good tutoring with Federica, with Elisa, so we need to uh, to work at this level. If you want to enlarge the base of people that uptake this uh, solutions, you have to prove that they are. I mean, you can easily govern. Of course, you can make an upgrade and you can uh, increase the complexity of, uh, of the system, but you need to be affordable for all those. And there is a need, not just in Europe. This Eurocentric talk about what we do, uh, although with different kind of disciplines of mainly all gravitating around natural and sciences. I mean, I, it's very interesting. Uh, absolutely, it's lovely, but there is much, much more than, more. than this. And, and there are different kind of sectors that can be used. Like for instance, today we have a teacher school and we have a practitioner that uh, like me and uh, or, you know, competing and trying to monitor and demand it. Uh, and uh, we're not all affair to a research center of university. Um, people working as international consultant, people working for an NGO, uh, people working at school and teacher. So uh, what we do with those, and I think there is a potential there, out there, a big one. And then the other challenge is how to extend the services to people they might need around the world. And it's very much like the, 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 what we, we try to do with the ICTP UNESCO in this and, and with the UNESCO recommendation, there's a lot of um, meeting a contact point with the European Open Science Cloud policy. And, uh, and if you remember uh, Santiago uh, from Quito, they had a problem of this computational expense investigation they do with the volcanoes, et cetera. So 
and using the services help them uh, dramatically uh, to, 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 I mean, a way to improve the research, to make quality research. And I think that this is just a narrative of many others. We, we also had the opportunity to, to have a, a seminar for Africa during Reliance, if you remember, in Rwanda. Of course, you know, that was difficult then to pick them up, but why not to do that? So um, let's get out of front of the box as natural scientists, please. Uh, get a more encompasses inclusive with other users that are not gravitating around the research area and be more multidisciplinary and open outside Europe. I think that uh, just what I... That's I the lesson learned, uh, especially for all the early adopters. Uh, yeah. session. So I think it's... Uh, I hope this... They, they let me know. That's not... Yeah. Thank you very much to both of you. And I mean, that was particularly challenging for you to prepare for this, given that you were both actively presenting this morning. So thank you for, for that. And to all of our session chairs um, for setting us up nicely for our panel session, which will now start. So um, I'd like to invite all of our panelists now to um, switch their cameras on. I'm not going to do lengthy reintroductions of the first four of our panelists. We have six panelists in total. Um, so the first four you were introduced to um, yesterday or today because they've all previously presented um, as part of the previous sessions. So firstly, we have Cassandra Gold van Praag, um, who takes part in the Open Air Nexus project and presented yesterday. Um, we have Bjorn Gruning, um, who's involved in the EGI ACE project. We've got Tjerk Kreiger, who um, participates in EOS Future. And we've got Milutin Milenkovic, who's involved in C scale, and all of them presented very, very interesting um, presentations. I think I think they were all yesterday, actually. Um, but in addition, we've got two further panelists who I'd like to welcome, um, who have not previously presented to us um, during the the workshop so far. The first one is Brian Cahill, who um, is from the Marie Curie Alumni Association. Um, so welcome, Brian. Um, and um, so, Brian, um, it's difficult to summarise actually exactly how to how to introduce you, Brian. But uh, you work in the Learning and Skills Analytics Lab at the Leibniz Information Centre for Science and Technology in Hanover, um, and you're also in the governing board of Euroscience um, and. Uh, a member of the board of directors of the SciLink Foundation, and as I've already mentioned, you're um, in, you have previously served as the chair of the Marie Curie Alumni Association. So I think you bring a very, very good perspective to us here, um, representing the the points of view of um, what we would call end users. Um, and then also, I'd like to welcome Alexander Beresko um, to join us here this morning. Thank you very much. So. Um, Alexander is from the Ukraine. He's a, an associate professor, professor at the Lviv Polytechnic National University, and he's a board member at Eurodoc, which is the European Council of Doctoral Candidates and Junior Researchers. So welcome all of you, all six of you, and thank you very much for being here to take part in this panel session. Um, I'd ask you please to keep your contributions somewhat brief because we are um, running late at the moment against the planned schedule. Um, but if we go straight into the panel, so firstly, I'd like to start with questions to our first four panelists, actually, who, who have presented use cases um, uh, over the last couple of days. And we'd like to look firstly at what worked well and benefits. So um, I'll go, I'll simply go through you each in, in order, uh, not the most natural form in a, a virtual panel session, but I'll go first to Cassandra. So benefits and what worked well from your experience. Um, I think the, the main benefit for the researchers that I represent is the, the seamless integration. So we saw interoperability and things being um, highlighted. The fact that a researcher can perform new behaviours, uh, um, take on new practices without the added complications of worrying whether they're going to work or not, so that they can have confidence in the system, I think it's really key. And um, in terms of benefits, it means that I'm able to and my researchers are able to uh, keep up with the curve in terms of adoption of these new practices and things like um, demonstrating your outputs and things. It's it's really important now that researchers are able to give themselves an edge when they're looking at career development and then these services are fantastic for enabling that. 
Excellent, thank you very much. Okay, and then um, the same question then to Bjorn. <clears throat> yeah, I think it's it's similar. Um, so I think the biggest advantage is accessibility. So and accessibility on different on different levels. So there's the obvious one that accessibility to infrastructure, but on top of the infrastructure is the accessibility to actually tools, workflows, and interactive, um, yeah, interactive environments or trusted environments. And I think this gives all, us also the, the freedom to enhance the user experience, which on its own enhances usability and accessibility of our users. So I think that's one of the biggest things that this has enabled. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, just a reminder to all of you in the audience, please feel free to post questions in Slido. Let me make a quick check. Yeah. There's none in there at the moment, but please do feel free to pose any questions you have for any of our panelists. Um, and I'll go now to Cherk, if you would like to give us your impressions, please, Cherk. Yes, please. Um, so I think from my perspective, I think we have the onboarding and integration with EOS on three different levels, actually. So we have the individual research infrastructures that are involved in the science projects. Then we have the science project um, involved in the science clusters. And then we have the science clusters as a whole. So we have three different levels where we can have some benefits from this uh, EOSC environment. So regarding uh, the individual research infrastructures, I can give you an example from CDataNet. Um, so we've imported around 12 services that are related to CDataNet. Um, such that they can now easily be found in the marketplace. And um, I think that works really well. Maybe the onboarding process was quite tedious still, but there was you know, an easy form to fill in. There was a lot of work. It was a bit difficult to get to the provider's dashboard where you can actually then start onboarding. But all in all, now it's very useful because you can actually, um, but I'll come back to that later. In the marketplace, I think the search capabilities is very, very well. So we can find those services now. And then going, for example, to the science project, the dashboard that we uh, also onboarded to the marketplace uh, is also uh, accessible from there now. And with the AI, we have integrated to the um, EOSC AI. So now people can use a variety of login uh, possibilities to access the dashboard. And in the future, when we're more uh, developed, can actually upload their indicators. Um, so yeah, there's there's different levels from, uh, from this perspective, which makes it very interesting. Yeah, good, thank you very much. Okay, and then to Milutin, give us your impressions, please. Yeah, hi uh, everybody. Yeah, so um, my experience uh, within the C-scale uh, use case was uh, was actually very positive. Yeah, so uh, first of all, I, I got a lot of support from EOSC uh, uh, stuff to onboard my code uh, to the to the cloud, and they they really helped me uh, in identifying some some pitfalls in uh, in in the code. Uh, uh, yeah, for example, yeah, with the uh, concurrent jobs, uh, so how we can uh, address that. Uh, uh, differently during the coding and uh, and it was also nice to see that uh, data provider and and uh, compute uh, computational infrastructure houses were collaborating so so we actually fetched the data from a data provider and put it locally so this was all supported uh, uh, and uh, yeah and another big uh, asset uh, was the flexibility yeah because i was really able to to design my workflow as as i liked yeah so so uh, and, and using any tools i i, I wanted to use so uh, primarily i i use some open source tools because i wanted everything to be reproducible and open and actually that's that's really cool you know because at the end of uh, of the of of this exercise we done uh, uh, the the whole research will be reproducible which is very important uh, today you know also to 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 show to 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 people not involved in the research that the uh, results we get are are, are fully uh, trust trustful yeah and and reproducible great thank you very much so actually that's quite a nice list and a reasonably lengthy list of um the positives um from your experience involving eosc so that's a nice way to start 
but <laughs> let's move on inevitably. Um, so having looked at the, the what went well, um, let's move on and take a look at um, challenges and improvements. So looking at things that have worked less well in your experience um, or challenges that you face, um, improvements that you'd like to see. Um, and at this point, I'll bring in our, our two other panelists. So um, Brian, I'd like to go to you first, if that's okay, please. So if you can share your impressions, please. Um, thanks very much, Dale. Um, I think I'm just speaking as kind of the grant manager of a cost action that's going to run a survey on researcher mental health and that we were just at the beginning of setting up a survey on, on that and that kind of to find a service provider to host data that can be accessible, sensitive personal data that can be accessed throughout our international network is proving very, very uh, difficult. And I know that this is something that EOSC is working on and that we were, we were, uh, we're in the process of following up to see if there's any services within EOSC that could help us address this problem. Um, but this is, I think, that the first service provider that we went to said at, at the beginning that they could do it, but uh, have pulled out. So while we're in the middle of setting up the, <laughs> the dissemination of the survey, so but I think that has caused a delay. Um, from a career point of view, I can see that the kind of the uh, kind of the transferability and the accessibility of services has a huge career benefit for researchers, particularly early career researchers um, who are and who are very often internationally mobile. And kind of, or, or even kind of from one discipline to another, so that kind of where you can, uh, where EOSC can provide services that will follow them through the next years of their career. I think this is something that is is hugely beneficial. Um, I think that just the discipline of providing, I think, in the data science area. Um, where I think traditionally academics, apart from in certain fields, such as in particle physics, but in many fields, nobody ever read the code. <laughs> and so that's kind of that by having uh, the discipline to provide metadata and uh, kind of used by others, I think this pr produces a huge career benefit to researchers because they learn to, to work in the way that industry works. And that they, uh, and they could, uh, I think the career benefit, because uh, very often um, this has been a problem for academics to, to transition to careers outside academia. So I think in, in I think that I'm really beginning to follow EOSC Future to see what services can be accessed and how, how uh, I can contribute. And uh, I think this is, is something that uh, but I, it's from the outside. It's quite it's quite difficult to um, see the marketplace and to see which uh, services can be accessed and how. So I think this is uh, kind of uh, something that I would personally need to look at over the next uh, months and years. Thank you very much. Um, very interesting um, about the marketplace not seeming clear, but I'm really pleased actually that you mentioned the, the career aspects as well, actually, because I, I agree, I think this is hugely important and it's, it's actually very interesting to hear that from your perspective, you see that, that the EOS can, can deliver benefits there. That's very interesting to hear, thank you. Okay, so Alexander, welcome. I'd like to pass to you now, please. So if you want to give us your um, impressions, please, in terms of challenges and improvements. Uh, thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. So um, I represent a new Dogs European Council of Doctor Candidates and Junior Researchers here. And uh, to be honest, I had several interviews, very short interviews with my colleagues to prepare for this uh, panel discussion and try to capture their impressions of EOSC and what can be done and what, what perhaps works less. And perhaps, um, if I'm not mistaken, the new logo of EOSC was introduced <laughs> in May. Right, the logo um, uh, clearly referring to this infinity symbol. And um, that's perhaps the strongest thing of EOSC and the weakest thing at the same time. So EOSC um, tries to be universal and um, very comprehensive. And uh, it can't be the other way, right? But uh, if EOSC is aiming at producing, let's say, a single entry point for researchers, especially early career researchers, uh, much needs to be done in terms of interface. If you remember, there was a, serv uh, a service by Google called Google Wave, 
a decade ago, if I'm not mistaken, which uh, aimed at universality and which failed. <laughs> Of course, I, I'm not I'm sure that EOSC will not fail, of course, and will be super successful, but still, uh, in terms of learning curve and interface, it's very important because at the moment, uh, there are huge uh, number of filters, huge number of uh, services, huge number of options, uh, which are not intuitive, unfortunately, and uh, which prevents many early career researchers from diving deeper right so perhaps some new approaches perhaps using artificial intelligence some uh, prompts whatever else could be uh, very helpful for this so that's that's our point thanks thank you very much very good um, input from the co face there thanks that's really really interesting to hear um, right. Okay. So I'll I'll turn again to our um, our other panelists, and I'll just mix up the order a little bit here. So, um, Cherk, if I can turn to you first, please, to give me your impressions on challenges and improvements, please. Yeah, and I will um, give my view from the provider perspective, so not from the user. Um, so we we compile the so-called service integration onboarding matrix with the um, from a survey that we uh, did among the research infrastructures involved in the Inverfair Science Cluster. And what this matrix includes is information about the status of onboarding of services and integration with the core services from those individual research infrastructures. Um, and what we found is that many of these research infrastructures, they are very interested in integrating with these core services, but they need more information about the functionalities before they could decide. So they're just not clear enough about what do these courses exactly do for us? And from my point of view, when I was researching, okay, what are these core services about? I also found pretty difficult to get information about those uh, core services because there's this wiki, the ES Future Wiki, which includes these fact sheets about the core services, but I was missing some of the services there. I, I didn't think they were included. And all in all, it's pretty difficult. Um, if you have an example from one discipline, to then transfer to a different discipline. I, I remember there was one about order management, which included, I think, the uh, the computing resources that can be ordered. Uh, but if you then translate that to a different discipline or to a different service, it's difficult to interpret it uh, to what it will benefit from, from that different services. So um, yeah, some, some more examples on how these core services can be used, more documentation, uh, also from different services and disciplines could really help in, um, you know, kickstarting those research infrastructures and also integrating with these core services. So, yeah, that's from the provider perspective. Yeah, yeah. thank you very much. Yeah, good good feedback. Thank you. Okay, um, Milutin, if I can pass to you next, please. Yes, so, uh, yeah, from my point of view, challenges within the C-scale I, uh, I was facing was mainly related to the data transfer. And uh, so it, it was, as I said before, it was nice to see that the data were transferred to the infrastructure for computation and, and in earth observation that the field where, where I'm doing my research, it's, it's the data, of course, are very important, the, the satellite images and so. And, and then uh, actually we had a lot of uh, um, uh, issues to ensure that uh, the data are we we have on uh, data provider side are identical on then when we transfer them to the infrastructure. Yeah, and uh, there are a lot of, uh, so this is all feasible and doable. Yeah, and it's uh, it's just a technical task, but uh, uh, from the research point of view, it, it really takes you a lot of time and and actually keeps you still away from, from your research. Yeah, so you are dealing with some technical things you, you have to resolve. And, and I could imagine, yeah, for me, actually, it was quite interesting because uh, I have some technical background and uh, it's, it's interesting to learn that, but for some general, user I, I i would see that as a as a uh, as a bit of an issue and and also speaking about uh, uh, flexibility as i underline as as advantage for for some general users they they maybe they are not interested in flexibility so i i think uh, maybe for some uh, a general user they 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 would like that that all this complexity sometimes is is masked uh 
for them so they don't they just don't see it yeah so I, as i said uh, with for persons uh, with a technical background it's interesting and nice to have but uh, uh, yeah for uh, yeah for others maybe not yeah absolutely different different sets of requirements based on the different types of users and of course the levels of of knowledge and expertise that they've got yep definitely thank you that's really really good comment okay um I'll go to Cassandra next, please. And just before you start speaking, Cassandra, actually just to say, um, once I've gone through all of our panelists, we've got two more panelists to speak just now in this round, um, I'll open the floor to the audience as well. So do prepare your questions or comments if you'd like to. So Cassandra, to you now, please. Thank you. Um, so I, I think my observation of challenges is, is um, similar to the first original speakers that uh, it's about awareness and education. You know, I'm an open science professional. I work in brain imaging. It's a complex science. Um, but I, like hands up, I was very unaware of the full extent of the services that are available. And I've been digging into it. And I, same, I still can't quite see which what um, services are going to fit with our use case. Um, and, you know, at a more basic level, I'm still teaching a lot of our ECRs and some PIs and some students what to DOI is, you know. So the kind of, we're working at very different levels or, you know, maybe how to use a DOI appropriately or how to generate them. So I'm, I'm working at this level where we've got some really low level education to do. And then you're at this level where there's this massive complexity and kind of opacity and like difficult to get into things. So I think it's going to be interesting to see how where you can contribute to crossing that gap crossing that bridge whether that's in you know advocacy around um, education at, at doctoral or undergraduate stuff or or um or whether that's even a space that you want to enter in, into at all yeah thank you and i suppose it what you i don't know if you mean to be hinting at this but to me it, it, it points a little bit towards the need for a certain amount of hand holding and, and perhaps super users and things like that thank you okay and then bjorn to you please I found that very interesting. Um, I, I think that's the key challenge, right? Awareness, raising awareness about the services that we're developing. Mm, but maybe I, I add a new point to that, and that is um, actually scaling user support at some level. So with these, with these um, European Galaxy server, we will hit probably 100,000 users in, in one or two years. Um, and we have this problem now that we offer 3,000 different tools to the user, but all these tools, if you put in the wrong parameter set, right, they don't perform well or they have their issues. And, and then people come actually back to you and asking, hey, um, I run this workflow and it works on this data set, but it doesn't work on that data set. And scaling this level of user support, I think we we need to consider and we need to prepare for that, right? Because in the end, if all our services are working and we have thousands of users, this will be, I guess, the next challenge where we then really need to have domain experts actually helping um, yeah, in, in, in those cases to scale up also the user support. Thank you very much. Okay, so as I mentioned, I'm going to open the floor now um, to anybody in the audience who would like to ask a question or make a contribution. So I see a hand raised, uh, Julia Malaguerna, if you'd like to unmute. Thank you everyone now for uh, uh, participating here and uh, I was very interested for uh, the comments from uh, Brian and uh, Alexander in particular on the user interface and also the comment from uh, Cassandra about the training because these are uh, three key aspects uh, that we are working on in uh, YOSC future uh, and uh, of course we know that from uh, early user who doesn't know the service that are already present uh, in the marketplace it's difficult to uh, find uh, what you really need. <laughs> and uh, this is also a challenge uh, for uh, us in the user interface to guide you uh, 
uh, between uh, all the services that are there. Uh, it was mentioned before about the filters uh, and uh, about the Google Wave. Uh, if uh, Alexander is there and uh, would like to give us more insight or more uh, desire about this little interview that he made, it would be nice. Thank you. Do you want to go ahead, Alexander? Hey, I just want to say that uh, Eurodoc is, I mean, very open for collaboration, and we, we actually it's my one of the, my next points. And if you would like to get some like focus session with early career researchers with the help of Eurodoc, I, we are very much open to it. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. And also, Julia commented, of course, about essentially matchmaking. Does anyone want to make any more comments relating to to Julia's comments? No, okay, thank, thanks, Julia. Um, any other comments from the audience? Um, there's nothing coming in on Slido. Okay, so just a little note about timekeeping before we move forward. So at the moment, we're running about five minutes late on the original schedule. Um, so I would say, so the, ne the next part of the panel session actually relates to needs um, and the slightly longer term. And I think given how interesting all the contributions have been so far, um, I would be a little reluctant to rush everything and, and cut, you know, cut the, the contributions so that we finish at um, 12.15. So I would just prepare you in the audience, even though I know numbers might start to drop off. Um, I would expect that we probably will run a little bit beyond the original scheduled 12.15 finish point, but I'll try not to let us run too far over. Um, so that's what I'd suggest, and we'll see how this goes for the final session. I see there's a hand raised. Um, Hans, do you want to unmute? Yes, I did. Uh, I can see myself. Well, yeah, there I am. Hello. Um, thank you for these very varied and interesting contributions uh, uh, over the last two days. Um, I, I want to... Uh, uh, Put, a, put this as a question to you. Uh, if e, uh, EOSC and in particular the uh, Research Object Hub were to be very successful and captured all digital objects from every scientist in the world, uh, you might end up with a huge heap of bytes. And uh, the, the real question I think has been addressed partly by Bjorn about the quality of uh, of code, but also by one of the presenters of the last session, I think, um, that just something like like doesn't help very much. What about the, well, what about the mechanism to, uh, to make sure that the objects are, let's say, reliable? Uh, quality assessment, uh, quality control. Um, do you envision any method general method to be included just as this just that it is with publications in the form of peer review thank, thank you, you. For a very interesting question so um your views then on the need for quality control quality assessment um anybody want to volunteer to start there's no need to impose an order on this who would like uh, to sorry that would be one mechanism or the mechanism the point is about actually about reliability of the contents as a whole. Sure. How to how to ensure that? Okay, sure. So, um, will I go to Bjorn if none of you are volunteering to start with? That's a very tough question. Um... No, no, there is a hand raised from uh, Raúl. Huh? Raul, I think you can unmute. Yes, hello, hello everybody. Um, so sorry, I, I didn't catch the whole the whole question, but I think that you were talking about how to ensure the the quality of of the research some in in some way, uh, leveraging some of the available services and tools that we are presenting here, right? So it's in this direction. Yes, because um, you know. Um, some of the things that um, uh, of the benefits, for example, in terms of using this uh, um, type of um, 
rich research object that was presented, for example, in the previous session, is also the possibility to um, uh, make some kind of assessment because the research object is an encapsulation of all the materials related to a particular investigation, to a particular research, to a particular observation. So there are tools in, in part of, as part of Reliance, um, we are bringing some tools that we call them uh, checklists that allows uh, the validation or assessment of the quality of the um, research object based on some of the requirements uh, already expressed by the communities, right? So, so the requirements in this case of the quality of the research is based on whatever communities think that is needed for uh, in order to have a, uh, an investigation that is reproducible, an investigation that can be really later on reused by others. Uh, so that, for example, of course, includes that the you know research object has a particular metadata that is necessary to to allow this reproducibility, but also that has all the materials and that the materials are accessible, uh, and that kind of uh, you know encapsulation is already something possible based on the research object concept and paradigm. So that that's one thing, and of course the the other kind of assessment that you could do is in terms of the of the fairness, the general fairness. Of course, as we know, fair, there are many different services already to assess this, the fairness of a particular data set or a particular um, uh, elements of the investigation. But in also, there is also now the possibility to make the fairness assessment of the whole research uh, based on the research object. So just, just to put this, that there are some, some things in this direction that might be useful for, for that. Yeah, thanks very much, Ro. Um, and um, I mean, if any of the panelists would like to comment further, then please feel free to do so. Um, I would add that, um, I mean, I think there's on the one hand, there's um, self-certification of research objects by the their originators. Um, and then on the other hand, I think over time, there's the possibility if you envisage EOSC as a platform, if you take that kind of view of it, then over time, you could imagine that there's the sort of TripAdvisor type um, voting by users, if you like, where people rate things. Um, but of course, that, that would then be based on their, well, essentially their reuse of, of objects. And of course, it takes time to build up these, these sorts of ratings. Um, does anyone else want to add to this topic? Just, um, sorry, I was looking for the hand button. Thank goodness. Um, yeah, just just to echo like the importance of this as a kind of a marker for people that are hesitant in these kinds of spaces you know when i say oh look here's my cv here's all my outputs some people meet that with well how do i know any of these outputs are any good you know there's no peer review so who's checked my code who's who's checked my data and we talk about different ways of you know doing something like peer review um but i, th I think it's we should allow ourselves to be a bit more inventive in these things and um, looking at different ways of having the validation of our colleagues imparted upon our outputs. I think it's, it's really essential um, without getting into the mess that peer review has kind of created in some instances. Yeah, thank you. Bjorn? Um, I, I think what, what Raul mentioned is more or less a technical solution for that. And I think we can come up with technical solutions. That's that's true. But ultimately, that's a community problem, I think. And I would say that we have way more data than we will have publications. And we know that publications already doesn't really scale with peer reviewing and that the peer review process is kind of broken. So maybe I'm too pessimistic here, but um, by the sheer amount of data and, and what we would like to have as a research object, um, I'm very skeptical that we can come up with a, with a peer review process for all these kinds of data. And the technical solutions that we can implement is probably also, I mean, people need to stick to them, right? People need to annotate those objects. People need to review them. This is a coming up with a process that is scalable in these directions. I'm not sure this will work. 
So the, the only solution that I see is, is kind of what, Dale, what you said, that there will be some kind of community process um, that we can probably not even enforce, that, that will bubble up the good research objects to some degree, right? I mean, you, you made the, the comparison with TripAdvisor or, or these kind of things. Um, I guess what we should ensure is that we label and that we make those research objects accessible, that we let people annotate them, right? And then hope that the community comes up with a, with a good process to bubble up the good ones and to keep down the bad ones. Or to make another comparison, there's this Apple App Store and there's a Google App Store, right? One is very controlled. You need to pay for that or they, they charge you for that. It's very controlled. And the other one is more free. You can add your stuff, but people will find out what are the good apps, what are the bad apps, right? And you have these both models. The one model in Apple is very expensive for them. They need to have a lot of curation, but you only get good ones. With a Google one, you get also the bad ones, but the community is kind of keeping up that. And I think we need to discuss that, what we want to have, if there's even a middle ground. But we are dealing with way, way more research objects in the end, right? And even hopefully probably more than papers. And we need to keep that in mind, right? And, and all these annotations that we maybe can enable with technical solutions needs to be done. And someone needs to do it. And I don't see our community and the money that is involved big enough to actually do that at the moment. Yeah, I think I mean, once again, the, the challenge of the sheer scale of, of what CEOS is attempting to, to be or to do. Thank you. Um, Brian. I, I think this is quite interesting because I think that the people who end up going through a lot of this sort of code or outputs are early career researchers or first year PhD students. And to have high quality uh, content that can guide them in their work can save them a lot of time and be very, very productive for them. But it's it's also a matter of, kind of, kind of more senior researchers probably don't have the time to do this sort of, um, of, of gatekeeping. Uh, it's just like peer review. Um, but it's it's also it's also a, a tremendous service to the community when it's done well. And I think this is is part of uh, is, is where we're, we're at and kind of if it's a peer review, but I think that citing um, kind of open open um, kind of open outputs is something that can be done, but very often isn't done. So I think as a community, we need to cite resources that we have used that have been proven useful to us and kind of to do that for, for code and other research outputs that are provided openly. Thank you. And I see we've got someone from our audience, Francis Crawley, please feel free to comment. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dale. Um, I just want to say thank you, first of all, for such two very good mornings here in Leuven in Belgium. Been a fantastic discussion. Um, in, in regard to this, um, I think I keep going back to it in my own mind anyway that one of the things that's really needed to achieve um, open science is academic assessment reform. So, research assessment reform. This is something that we're doing here in, in Europe now with uh, COARA. Uh, this has just been put together. And I think this is critical because we won't get researchers to use these platforms unless the way their research is evaluated is, is also um, feeds into that as well. Um, I don't think we will get rid of peer review. Peer review is something that's embedded in science. It's part of science. Science is a community activity. So even TripAdvisor, if you look, is a kind of peer review. The question is more or less maybe how we go about doing peer review. And I think uh, a particularly important topic here, Dale, I know you're involved with it, is the governance of this. Um, how do we ensure quality of the data items that are put up there? How do we ensure the integrity of those items? FAIR doesn't help us with these questions to some extent perhaps, but it doesn't in, in ensure the veracity or the reliability of the data that's there. 
And that's a critical issue here. And then finally, I think for my own camp here, it's really important to have good ethics and to have good policy. And these are the really fundamental structures that we need. So thank you for giving me the floor for a few minutes. Thank you very much. Yeah, very interesting comments. And I'm really, really pleased you raised um, Koara because I think it's a really key part of um, the incentivization, if you like, to, to reform things as necessary that, that will help to actually stimulate usage of EOS, but also, of course, actually improve the relevance of EOS to, to researchers as well. So it's a really, really key piece of the, the jigsaw, I think. So I think, Malutin, you, you raised your hand next. Yes, yeah, uh, thanks. Um, yeah, very interesting discussion, uh, totally. And what uh, I wanted to, uh, actually one of the problems from my use case is that I will produce a lot of data yeah, and with earth observation and the field where I'm working. So we are processing terabytes of data and output is, is a kind of, a, let's say minimum gigabytes of terabytes, but the data, uh, are itself uh, are not useful if they are just uh, published somewhere without access to the uh, uh, further uh, computational resources. So without the access of other researchers to to this data, yeah. So mm -hmm. downloading them, putting on their infrastructure is is again again the same problem I had when I prepared that data. So we are. So uh, actually, uh, one of the missing things currently outside is, is some kind of, of a hybrid journal. So there are a lot of journals about publishing the data, but there is no infrastructure attached to that. And, and, and uh, uh, this is the place actually where I, uh, where EOS can, can contribute. Yeah? So like making like hybrid environment, we can call it journal. Yeah, hybrid journal, whatever, with uh, editors and and so. Uh, but I I would even put it more flexible. You know, like if if I can imagine uh, uh, a new PhD researchers in my field. You know, they uh, we we can validate our results. Yeah, we have some in situ data measurements on the field that that are usually smaller, and they uh, our data can be validated uh, and results and this results to the publications. Yeah, this is very motivating. For for young researchers, so actually the, we can rely on validations from others. Yeah, if if they would like to use it, they can they they can start validating it. And and if we have environment that allows us to store the data, to do the computations, and onboard uh, like uh, uh, the code to that, I I think then that that that, that could be a, a that that would be a perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Alexander, and then we'll we'll move on into the needs. Although I mean, this is to do with needs actually, but we'll move more specifically to the needs part. Over to you. Thanks. I will be very quick. I just want to second comment from Francis regarding research assessment, and as I believe, and the Eurodoc believes that early career researchers are the key to switching towards open science and more responsible research assessment. So, if uh, we really need, we really want EOSC to be used. Uh, especially given the, uh, the relatively difficult learning curve, we need to incentivize it. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Alexander. Okay, so really, really interesting discussion there. And um, I'm, I'm conscious of the time. Um, I'm quite sure we could go on discussing about all of this for hours. There's so many really important, really interesting um, questions and, and challenges that we that we could all get stuck into. I think what I'll say is we will do a hard stop at 12.30, okay? Um, but we, we have got a couple of more questions that we had um, envisaged as a panel to, to cover, and I think it would be a shame not to take the opportunity to do that. So I'd like to go firstly to um, Oleg and to Brian. Um, and the question that was put to them for this part um, was, how do you see the contribution or support of EOSC for early career researchers and research beneficiaries of the Horizon Framework Programme? So contributions and support of EOSC. So I'll go to Alexander first, I'll go back to you, please. Uh, so regarding contributions and, co I mean, using EOSC uh, among early career researchers, uh, let's say um, we are aware the, that there is many learning materials available, but mm -hmm. still uh, perhaps, um, it's still not obvious. And uh, while mm, most 
uh, researchers are available, are aware of EOSC. They uh, not completely understand what it is and how it works. So um, I think that we should work in this direction. And as I said, Eurobook is very open to initiatives of promoting EOSC and participate in devising some, let's say, courses, whatever else webinars to promote. And again, let me stress that um, as Eurodoc is a very uh, active member of COARA and uh, one of uh, early uh, signatories of the agreement of research assessment, we are very much aware of the need to incentivize using uh, open science services and EOSC as a major, let's say, and flagship project in this regard. Mm, thank you. It might be interesting for you to be in touch with the people in EOS Future who are dealing with the Knowledge Hub um, to talk about, about needs there. Um, Brian, over to you. Thanks very much. Um, I think I would also like to say that kind of MCAA and Eurodoc are both involved in the Opus project, which is about uh, kind of looking at incentivization of using open science and kind of a research assessment as well. And this, this is a project that uh, is, is something that EOS could definitely cooperate with and uh, it, in, many, in the same ways. But I definitely think that early career researchers are very often kind of early adopters of practices and that if there are services available through EOSC that can be used, that uh, early career researchers will use these services. So I think it's a matter of um, finding uh, ways to integrate. To, to, I think there are so many services available on the marketplace that can be integrated into the research of individual researchers and um, I, becoming part of, I think if, if you look at, say, Zenodo, um, it, that's an, an open source um, literature program, um, but who would use EndNote, uh, a proprietary um, software when you can use something that can be transferred very easily from job to job throughout the rest of your career. And I think this is something that's uh, going to be true through EOSC and EOSC future services that are provided and will come on the market in the next years. Great, thank you very much. Okay, so now I'll move to our other four panelists. Um, and here we were we wanted to have a look at the longer term, so sort of a 10 year view. Um, I see there's a hand raise, I'm guessing it's to do with, with what we've just dealt with. So Francis, if you want to briefly um, come in there before I move on to the, a slightly different uh, question. Yeah, thank you, Dale. Um, I just want to say with relationship between EU programs like uh, Horizon or um, IHI uh, or something, I think these are critically important to have open science. I've spent so much of my life on European projects, and to see at the end that there's no repository, there's no place for the project to go in a certain sense, there's no place for it to go. And I want to say this is not only important for science and scientists, this is really critically important for society. So I really follow UNESCO's um, declaration or recommendation on open science because it points to the importance of open science for society as a whole. Uh, society funds this science. Society should be receiving the results of this science, and we should have a more democratic approach to science this way. So I see open science sine qua non going forward here for Europe. It's critical for European science. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for that contribution. Right, we will move on now to the, the final question for, for the other four panellists. Um, so this was a longer term view, really a sort of a 10 year um, outlook. Um, the question is, what does EOS need to provide to enable cross disciplinarity in the next 10 years? Um, so I'll go first, perhaps to Tjerk on this round. Yeah. I think it's a great question, a very difficult question to answer, and there's probably not one correct answer, but uh, I think that uh, the platform needs to provide a um, a space and place for tools for scientific communities so they can grow and collaborate with other communities. So by enabling this interoperable data and services and by supporting this open science, 
uh, we can allow these scientific communities to to provide their data in a way that they can be used by multidisciplinary communities. Um, uh, so more concretely, I think EOS needs to provide a solid catalog of services plus data sets, but then also enable to use these data sets related with those services. Um, and of course, it comes down to pushing fairness for the data uh, with a focus on these formats, semantics, um, and achieving this interoperability. But I think also important to note that you can never know because data grows so fast what will be required in 10 years, right? So EOS should provide and give these research communities the technical solutions so they can upgrade the research met methodologies and bring back you know, the big data era supporting machine actionable workflows in the future. So, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, Cassandra, I'll go to you next, please. Thank you. Um, so one of, one of my hats is as a community manager and we've been talk, hearing about community a lot and the way I have encountered EOSC reminds me of um, perhaps, you know, Brian Nosek's like infrastructure pyramid is like first you build the infrastructure and then they'll come. But as a community oriented person, I think perhaps the emphasis is in is, is not appropriately in the community of the people. You know, if you build the infrastructure, how are the community gonna find it? How do you know the infrastructure meets their needs? And I think it was Kirsty Whitaker of um, Turing Way that sort of first sort of twigged me onto this. So I think, I know there are programs like domain ambassadors and um, community managers, but I think that there should be a real emphasis on establishing a pipeline for people to engage with the EOSC and then have a way for them to become more and more embedded in community and also share their experiences and as researchers we are often regularly requested to do things for free uh, in addition to our research and all of this labor that these wonderful opportunities keep coming but we cannot continue to expect researchers to do these things for free so professionalizing the role of community managers and making a pathway for career development for people who want to engage with this and making them able to engage as a priority by not making it secondary to their research that would be my my emphasis mm, very good thank you very much um bjorn to you next I would like to see EOSC evolving into a platform, right? So currently EOSC is offering many platforms, many infrastructures, and I would like just to get them more together, uh, make them more interoperable in its own, so that in the end, the researcher has this, has a one platform where everything is integrated. Um, I think that would be the nice part in the end. So currently it feels like, Yes, you have this one page, but then it's very, yeah, it's, it still doesn't feel like one coherent thing. Um, and I think that's, again, um, for the accessibility and, and usability, I think that's a key thing that we need to achieve in the whatever this 10-year vision. Yeah, thank you. And it's a nice vision, but there's a long road ahead. Yeah, thank you. So last but not least, to Milutin, please. Yeah, actually, not much to add. Yeah, I, I would uh, agree with Cassandra about uh, communities, and uh, you know, like that's. I think that's that's really crucial, and uh, involving those people, and uh, yeah. So I think that's that's something that 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 can make uh, uh, EOSC place uh, that different communities uh, meet and explore their own data and results, and and discuss and and produce a new science. Yeah. Thank you very much. And I see, I mean, I, I hope you've all been following the, the comments that are being posted in the chat. And I see this, this comment here from Francis. Um, it can't only be about providing services. It's critical that EOS demonstrates the value of those services to science and to society. Um, we need stories of demonstrated value added to science and demonstrated value added to society. I think these are really important um, comments and, and a nice a nice comment actually to to wrap up on. Um, I promised you a hard stop at twelve thirty, and I think we're we're on target for that. So sadly, we don't have time for any more um, comments or questions from the floor. Although I can imagine there there may well be some. But I'd like to say thank you very much 
Um, firstly, to our panelists who I think have provided us with a very, very interesting final session to wrap up, but also to all of the um, contributors, the presenters, um, and of course the session chairs over the last couple of days. I think it's been an absolutely fascinating um, workshop, um, very well worth the time spent, and I'd like to just thank all of you for helping to make it um, so interesting, including some very rich contributions from the floor. So very much appreciated. Um, and thank you, of course, to all the organisers who've done all the hard work behind the scenes and have organised this very, very well for us all. Um, and just one final thing to say that the recordings of um, these sessions and the presentations will all be made available in the same place that you, you would have found the registration and the agenda in the first place. They'll all be up there as soon as they can be sorted out and, and posted up. So you'll be able to, to consult back at things. So thank you very much, everybody. Um, we're finishing on time, more or less. <laughs> and um, yeah, nice to see you all and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks and bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.